poo and fall and just like, eh, he's rubbing poo on each other. And finally, Odor just kills both of them because they suck. Here he is right now, ladies and gentlemen. Oh my god. Look. Pustulus, come hey, here. Hey, it's Pustulus. I'll tell you one thing. He Pustulus, does, how are you? This is Pustulus's first official interview. Really? Right here on loudwire.com. Come this yeah. way, my friend. Man, Excuse me. You, you bear a striking resemblance to your, your family member, uh, Flat. Antoinette and Aunt Sw- Cindy are doing very well. Thank you very much. I told you he was deaf. He probably doesn't understand the question so well. I saw recently on uh, one of your newer set lists that you guys have been playing Kansas's uh, Carry On Wayward Son. Postulus! He asked, are we playing a cover of a Kansas song? I believe I will try to take the test when it is upon time for me to achieve my license, but I do not think I will have any issues with it. Death is a a doornail. Completely Um, can't hear a word of it. So, uh, you know, why did you choose to pick such a horrendous song for your otherwise... Your horrendous You better yell! For your, you know, in your otherwise... Louder! Glorious Glorious Supreme! Your set list is really set good. Set list is really good. But that song sucks. That song sucks. Why are you playing it? I appreciate your salutations on our current set list. Yes, the song does suck. Humans need to have their ears bleed, and that is why we choose the song. He's not totally deaf. I guess he heard that. He can read lips. Apparently, he's learned his skill. I've been teaching him lip reading. <laughs> Hello, it's me, Kevin Von Esper. Welcome to the Guar Pod. You saw it right there. We got that was the first interview with Pustulus Maximus. And uh, I don't I guess we'll find out what the last one is. We'll see what's up with that with that accent and see how that developed over the years. Are you guys ready? I mean, dude, we got we got this guy on the show tonight. Who's who's excited? Everybody give this video a like right now. If you want to see Brent Ferguson on the Guar Pod tonight, I'm ready. You know, I think let's just start this thing, man. It's ready. Are you ready for the Guar Pod? I got my bloody tie on. I got a couple of my props. All right, it's time. Guar Pod comes from on Guar Pod. Guar Pod. Guar Pod. Hello, Brent what, uh... Ferguson. Uh, what do you remember about <laughs> your first interview that we just watched? That was cool, man. That was really cool to see that again because, uh, you know, I haven't watched that probably since it came out, you know, and it just yeah. makes me miss Dave a whole lot. You know, he was, it, it's just like, <laughs> he had a lot of bad interviews. Don't get me wrong. But uh-huh. he, he did a lot of amazing ones. And just like the way that he could just come up with shit off the cuff. And really the, and not just that, but the way he would command an interview. Oh, like yeah. You could see that he's leading that one. You know, he's, he's, the, the guy has a little, the interviewer has a little bit of wiggle room, but not much. Dave is in mm-hmm. control, you know. And I think that that was just like the best mentor to have when it came to public speaking, you know. Yeah. So right. that was fun. You had, hadn't quite grasped it yet, huh? <laughs> no, that one, I mean, it, it was literally like a trial by fire. It was just, yeah, like, and yeah. that was like the confidence that he had in me too. It was just like, just go for mm-hmm. it, you know. And um, Yeah, he had, and looks it like was, he had your back on that, you know. Yeah, yeah. When you were doing something with him too, it was like, you know, you, you'd know that it was, it would always be okay. <laughs> he would be able to take control and make it funny and, yeah. Do all that shit. You you wouldn't bomb as long as you were shoulder to shoulder with him. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's funny. The only interview that I think I've ever seen with him where he became kind of speechless was one that I filmed <laughs> for my old show, Twilight Vision. And my host made his own cuttlefish out of like just like tin foil and and shit. And 
Yeah, he, oh, wow. they, he, they were they were rubbing cuttlefishes, and he just didn't know what to say. It was amazing. Yeah. It was like you stumped Odorous Urungus. Like you get, you should have get an award for that. Nice. Uh, hello, how are you? Uh, this is your first post Guar interview, so I thought I'd play that because it's kind of like a full circle moment right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm good. I'm good. It is cold as fuck right now. Yeah, um, here in Virginia, I don't know the temperature number, but the last few days have been pretty, pretty brutal. You know, I like, I like sunshine and the heat and all that shit. So then what the fuck are you doing there? <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I understand it, great. It, it would take a lot to move all those amps. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll, it, I mean, it, it warms up eventually. I mean, I like winter cause you do get, you do get all four seasons here. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. yeah. I could imagine like that whole California lifestyle where it's like, oh, it's fucking 83 degrees, 365 days a year. Like that would blow my mind. I don't think I could do it. I'd go insane. I wouldn't mind it for maybe a couple of years. You know, I'm here in New York, so I get the four seasons too. And, you yeah. know, snow is great when you can look at it outside your window. And then when you have to go outside, it sucks. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, well, let's take it all the way back, Brent. I want to yeah. know before you even joined the band, like, what was your history with Guar? Like, were you a fan? Like, what? What was you know? What was your entry point? Just as a you know, pop culture. Um, with Guar, so Guar kind of is comes really early in. I guess my journey to heavy metal music and rock and roll and all that stuff. Like, mm -hmm. um, obviously this is, I guess the internet was around, but we didn't really have it. You know, it, it was a few yeah. years before I would get that. So, I mean, we would still have metal magazines and, um, you know, you'd have to go to the fucking store and get them or go to the record shop and get them. Um, and then the other way of learning, new music was just looking at other kids shirts and backpacks and shit, you know, and they would write, uh, in white out, you'd, you'd have like the LL bean book bag or the Jordash book bag. And in white out, you'd have all the band names and some people mm -hmm. would draw art and you'd get like a red paint marker and do the blood drips on obituary and all that stuff. So it was like, I remember this dude had Sepultura misspelled on his backpack. It was Sepultra. You know, that was pretty good. And then, and then Guar, and then he actually had a Guar patch. It was a little, um, I think it might've been the one with the bat wings mm. and, uh, and they were like cool guys, you know, like they didn't like anything that was silly. You know, it was just like, it had to be like gory and metal and, and serious and shit. And I was like, but you like, but what is this? And they were like, oh, you gotta, you gotta check it out. And, um. I did, and we were like probably sixth or seventh grade at the time, and and I was just like, and and your impression of the guar that you would get then, I think, is a lot different than what you would see now, and mm -hmm. it was definitely yeah. not friendly. It was scary. You didn't know who they were unless you right. were old enough and you lived in town, because again, internet, and so it was kind of like you had to kind of guess who they were, you know, and. It, it was just, it was something else. It was fucking yeah. nuts. You know? I'm telling you, it's hard to explain to kids. Like, I mean, I didn't quite have this experience with Guar, but it was close. You know, you'd see those black and white pictures that have been photocopied a couple too many times. And you don't know exactly what the fuck you're looking at. And you're like, are those creatures? You know, it just looks so creepy and scary. And yeah, that's what Guar so, was at, some, at one point. Yeah. And, and there really wasn't anything like it. I mean, it was no, nothing at all. I mean, Slipknot didn't exist yet. Yeah. And Slipknot, you know, it's it's costumed, but it's not theatrical. Yeah, um, yeah. At least not in the same way. Right. But, um, and then, I mean, I mean, Phallus and Wonderland and all that stuff. So, I mean, that's, no other, no other band had a full length video, except for maybe The Who that had Tommy and fuck that. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> so that's, that's a bit uh, different. Yeah. Other than like, maybe like the blues brothers was probably the closest thing to like what Phallus and Wonderland was, you know, and it was well, just bands back great. then they had like home videos, you know, it'd be like a collection yeah. of music videos and then like tour footage. 
Guar was like, fuck that. We'll just make a movie with this budget. Actually, I got, I'm, I'm in my student. My door is right here. I want to show you something that I've been yeah. just staring at while we were we love a that show and tell. Hello, everybody in the comments. So my, nice. so the kid, so What's it was like up, a kid Dred? named Dred's Will here. Yeah. Kid. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, hey. You know, Dred? Like a kid named Will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, right, I just have that? to because I went on tour with him. Oh, I can't. Yeah, I can't. Okay, because he's I can't 218. See I'm 237. Potty nice. mouth. Yeah. What's up, Dred? Sorry, go ahead. But yeah, that's all right. And then, uh, so it was like Will was one of the dudes that was like super serious, you know, in, in middle school. And, and Jonathan Schultz was another one. And Michael Schultz, his brother, we were best friends since like first grade and stuff. And, um, but yeah, their mom was really religious. Mine was too, but not like she didn't harp on me too bad about it. So anyway, eventually they made them get rid of this poster, and I was like, "I got it! I'll come over and get it." So, oh wow! Yeah, so I remember this is that. Like, so this yeah. is back. You know, I'm sure you guys have all seen this before and all that stuff. So, um, you know, it, oh shit! Oh no! In the tit. Sorry. Goddamn cardinal <laughs> sin. Uh, He's still attacking you. But like, yeah, so, so when I saw this on the on the my buddy's brother's older brother's wall, you know, we're looking at it and it was just like and you know what's what's funny too, right? Well, one, it's it's different. It's fucking mm -hmm. cool. And so this was the first time I'd really ever saw like Flattis, right? And I didn't, back then, I didn't even know what lead guitar and rhythm guitar was. You know, I just, I didn't even play guitar yet when I heard about My mom thinks band. they're different types of guitars. Oh, yeah, yeah. So let's see if I can play. So I'm looking at this, right? Fast forward fucking like 30, 35 years later, I'm sitting in my house and I'm texting Matt memes and shit, you know. And then I look at this little tattoo, like right there on the corner of his arm. And I just go, fuck, are you serious? I was like, so I texted him. I was like, Matt, that's you. So the, oh. the person that's Matt McGuire. So the person I thought like the way Flattis looked, I always thought it was this guy. I was like, Flattis is always the smaller, the skinnier guy. So when I would that's see funny. pictures of Pete Lee and, and yeah. other dudes down the road, I would go, Whatever happened? When did they get skinny? Like when was the well? Zach was pretty skinny. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's so funny. That cool. I know, like Flattis has a very sordid history, and many people have been in that costume. I didn't know uh, that was him. For I guess that was probably for the the Cardinal Sin video shoot or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So you get yeah. to learn something new like every day about Guar, right? And it, it's. Yeah, Flattis was one of the most portrayed characters as far as I know. It was just so many different um, iterations. And, you know, like uh, a buddy of ours, Stretch, is in – what video is he in? Oh, Jack the World, I think. Mm, so Yeah, like, because Pete had just gotten shot. He wasn't in a lot of that promo, promo stuff. I know Pete – I can't – no, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. I just know uh, – I know Stretch is Flattis in one video, Zach is him in one video, and of course, like Dewey and Pete. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, it's it's all over the place. And then even uh, in what is it, the "I'll Be Your Monster" video, mm -hmm. I was working, and uh, they were like, "We got to shoot this scene," and I was like, "Fuck, I can't get out of this," you know, plumbing business. Sometimes yeah. the shit doesn't stop, literally. So yeah. I was like, I, I can't fucking be there. I'm on the way. I'm on the way. Just do whatever you got to do. So Matt wore the Pushless costume for like <laughs> one scene in the, in the I'll Be Your Monster video. I think it's the scene when they're all like kind of like crowding around the bed or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. I got the, I got there and he was taking it off. And I was like, no, no, you got it. Go I said, like, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. You're fine. I don't have That's to get dirty today. Is. You don't know who's behind those costumes, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean... But do you think, okay, do you think they've learned something from that at this point by uh, having different people portray the same character? And I guess that, you know, I don't know if you have any say in this, but like, are you keeping the Pustulous character? Um, Would you want as to? Far you know? as, 
as as far as I know, yes. You know, we haven't really talked in like huge detail of right. um, of what the what the character is going to do in the future and what I'm going to do. You know, it's like I mean, I've definitely left. Um, yes, the, right. The touring right. party is. I mean, that's kind of the big thing. And um, as far as the character goes. I kind of wanted to have the same respect that like Chuck and uh, yeah, Techno and all that kind of had yeah. and Sleazy, of course, you know, it's like, because mm-hmm. even we've, we've talked about doing like sex execution or on stage and I'm like, we'll just get right. somebody else to sing it or do this. And they're like, no, 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 no. Like can't do it without Chuck. I'm like, yeah. well, that's cool. I respect that. So I like not that. that I, I want to. Yeah. 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 I think so. And plus, you know, cause I'm still around. We get along, you know, right. it's, uh, I think it would be cool to maybe do some kind of guest appearance later on down the road. Yeah. But um, all the characters usually like, like pop up every once in a while, you know? Yeah. And I, I think it's a good opportunity for them to take, you know, to create something new, give a yeah. new guitar player, like a, a totally new attitude and, a, and a, I guess a platform to pole vault from and take it in a new mm-hmm. direction and, and really expand upon this, the character universe, you know? Yeah, I I agree. I I would like that too. I I'm I don't mind new characters in Guar. Like actually that excites me a little bit, you know. It doesn't always work out, I guess, but uh it's yeah, fun yeah, to yeah. watch them try. Yeah, I mean the that's and that's what I loved about like that poster in and, mm-hmm. and that in just Guar in general was uh when I would watch like the old music videos and the live shows and stuff. I mean, even to get a live show back then, you know, pre YouTube it was like oh yeah you had to get like copies of tapes that people like had you know made with a camcorder at the show at the fucking that was me i'm sorry guar but my first guar video was a bootleg i bought at like a record convention and it's still one of the best guar shows i've ever seen in my life so when you 1993 halloween tour cleveland it was right after they recorded this toilet earth but before it came out so Bishop was still playing the songs with them. Oh, wow. Nice. It was the only time he played those songs with them in that era. It's it's great. Anyways. Yeah, because when you note, see those, it's, on YouTube. it's like all the characters on the stage. It's overwhelming just, in it a good way. Yeah. So fucking, it, it looks so fucking cool. And, you know, that's kind of what I missed kind of as we, we went on was we couldn't take two tour buses full of people, you know, it it just wouldn't logistically work. But then, and even when I would see Guar, um, well, I haven't seen Guar that much. I've been on the other side, but like Ghoul, for example, Uh I've toured with Ghoul quite a few times uh, with different bands and stuff. And uh, I saw Ghoul at at the Broadberry, small stage, not that wide. And uh, it's a shitty show. Like, for them because it's just cramped and they're opening and yeah. they, or they're like two or four or whatever there's gear everywhere so they gotta like do they all got stuff. a lot of stuff after too the, yeah yeah so after the show i'm like man the guys that was fucking great i loved it that was I, the action looked so cool and they're like are you serious like because for them it's it's tight and it's shitty and they can't move and i feel the same way when we play a small ass fucking club i'm like this fucking blows but then when you watch it and it's cramped, that frustration and the action and the, the condensed fucking, you know, characters it's all punk rock. Stuck out, it looks so fucking cool. Yeah. But it's miserable to play. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, one of the first times I saw Guar, and I don't know if anyone out there has seen them at this venue, but it was at the Birch Hill nightclub in New Jersey, Old Bridge, New Jersey. It's not there anymore. It's tiny stage, low ceiling, like you know odorous could probably reach up and touch the ceiling and they still brought out gorgor and and all this stuff it's it was just like oh, oh yeah my God. holy crap that's cool well i guess i should ask you brent why did you leave guar uh <laughs> man it was like probably i you know it was a long time coming and I, you know i sat and thought about it for a long time, you know, probably for years, you know. I, I want to interject and, quickly and say, I've been watching you do interviews for a long time where you would say, oh, yeah, maybe another five years. 
And I'm like, I wonder if that's actually going to happen. And it did. You were tell just like a lot of characters in the Guar universe, you kind of tell the truth through the story. Yeah, I, I, I did. And, you know, and a lot of times, yeah, my frustration would be, you know, art imitates life type of thing. And, well, it was uh, comedic. Yeah. I mean, I always try to be funny about it, especially yeah. with all like the, um, you know, you can see we're smiling and laughing, but Pustulus is always just like really negative. And it's, it's kind of fun to be that way. It's like cathartic. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, sometimes you'd live it a little bit too hard and I'd be that way in real life. So, mm. but, uh, <laughs> as far as leaving, you know, I mean, I guess it's, it's a lot of reasons, but I think the biggest one was just, um, you know, just growing, not growing up, but just growing apart. Uh, when, when, when I started life was just way different. You know, I had, yeah. uh, I had like one daughter and, and we had, was raising a son and, uh, kids get older, had more kids started a business, the business, yes. I, I started the business so I wouldn't have to get a job, you know, so I could just tour all the time. That was the goal. Right. And then, um, the goal just took off. Like uh, at first it was like, well, I can just put in two sinks a week. And as long as I can afford some weed and a 12 pack and keep the kids in school clothes and shit, you're like, Oh, everybody's mm -hmm. happy. It's cool. Right. And then like got sober the company started oh, making a lot more money. Uh, and then the, but the Guar money, you know, honestly, it really never changed. It was the same yeah. the whole time. I mean, nobody's in Guar to get rich. That's for sure. Nobody's in it for the money. So, yeah. and it's kind of yeah. fucked up when you see all these things that happen, like the, uh, like the NFTs and the, and the toys and all these products and, and you see all this stuff. So from an outsider looking in, it just like, oh, these guys are selling. <laughs> well, these guys are selling everything. So they have to have money. Like I even went on tour right. with a fucking guy. Um, I don't know. I could say who it is. Cause I, mm -hmm. I do like the band, but the singer and guitar player of the band was like, he's like, they're paying you. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, they're paying you. He's like, I know Dave Brocky's got all that money. And I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? And they had opened up for Guar too. And at a certain number of time and from them being in like a death metal band, He's mm -hmm. like, oh, I always, there's a thousand people there at night. I know y'all are making tons of money. I was like, but do you know how much a monster dick costs? Yeah. Right. So it, so I mean, the, so the band reabsorbs all this fucking money, you know, right. and it just, it, it's fucking, you know, you can't com complain about it. Cause that's just kind of the nature of the beast. That is, that right. it is what it is. So it's like the same thing that make bar amazing is the same thing that kind of holds it back a little bit, you know, but, but the band's been growing, you know, for the past yeah. decade. The exposure is there. It's not, I still wouldn't say it's mainstream, but it's, there's mainstream notoriety. Like everybody knows some semblance of what it is. You know, mm -hmm. if you're a hard rock, heavy metal fan, which is, which is pretty cool. I know it's yeah, great that, to be a part of that legacy for so long. Right. Yeah. There's a bunch of places I want to jump off there. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, where do yeah, I want to start? Ramble, so. Yeah, no, it's good. I'm just like, okay, where do I want to go with that? Um, all right, I don't think this is totally controversial because it was like a a thing, and I thought it was a kind of a disrespectful thing. But what did you think when that article came out? Where it took your fucking little Facebook comment and blew it up about like what you made in Guar? Because I didn't, I didn't necessarily see that as a slight to Guar. More just like a this is the this is the matter of fact of of the business of Guar. Yeah. What I did you it, feel I about it that? Up. It was I fucked it up, was right? Really fucked up. Yeah, because and I and I emailed the dude and I told him that straight up. I said that's it, his response was uh, what are they called? Not political, but it was his response was nice to me. I'm mm -hmm. um, like, oh, I didn't mean it that way, but I basically said that was fucked up. You knew what you were doing. That was clickbait. What, when when I left, yeah, when I left the band, I wrote, I tried to write it in the most, I don't want to say beautiful way ever, Elegant. but I wanted it to be touching because yeah. I mean, I felt, you know, I still feel strongly about the band and all my brothers in it. So 
I was like, you took something that was beautiful and you tried to make it like you tried to get people to talk shit about it. And of course, right. like people are like, oh, well, you know, I don't even remember the comments now because I only read them for like the first day. But there was so much shit talk in there. I was like, there was no shit talk on my initial exit, you know, thing. It was just a lot of fucking kind words, you know. And and I think that kind right. of clickbait yeah. article is just meant to get people get people going you know i don't like it i didn't like it at all and plus it was like i even i i said to the dude like if you would have asked me i probably would have told you like exactly what it was you know it's right. like yeah. but to to speculate i mean because what did i what did he do he took like the poverty it was thing a comment it, <laughs> yeah it was so it stupid was, Oh, that's what it was like. Somebody said like we made X amount of dollars per year, and I was like, it's not even half that. Which is right. Yeah, whatever yeah. it was was the, was the truth. But um, and I wasn't complaining about it. You that's know, what but, I yeah. Like, that's what I yeah. thought. I mean, yeah, I'm a I very, wanted to I mean, bring that up because it was just like, what did you, like, you know, I wanted to set that record straight. Um, and I mean, yeah, like I think everybody knows that Guar doesn't make a lot of money. That's like part of it. Uh, there's no but, mistake there on my part. Like I know, I knew what band I was joining from day one, you know, and right. I knew exactly what, what there was to look forward to. And I, I knew I wasn't going to, you know, fucking have a mansion being in Guar. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows that everybody yeah. that's in it knows that. Uh, so that, that's why I kind of chat my ass that they took that little blurb and ran with it, you know? Yeah. And but, I wanted to also jump off that you said, you know, Guar has been growing, and I, um, I, w I don't know. I wanted to comment on that. I suppose I think so too, and I hope so. I felt like, um, <laughs> okay, here's a question. Um, I saw the Mudvayne tour twice. I know that was like a oh, big awesome. leap. That was like a big leap into the Live Nation, you know, category. Yeah. But I saw, but I also saw the shows and. You know, it looked kind of sad out there. Um, how how was that experience for <laughs> Guar? I saw, and I don't know if that was specific to certain shows, but I went to Tampa and then um, Long Island. Yeah, I mean that the attendance was kind of like that. You know, it was, yeah. um, and that's so that's that's Mudvayne's tour. So, um, right. I guess all the bands underneath the undercard: uh, Cold Chamber, Guar, uh, Butcher Babies, and Nothing. yeah non-point yeah non-point <laughs> so i mean right all of us are doing all those bands could do their own tour and be okay and for some reason i don't necessarily think the combination worked as well mm -hmm. it, it did good i mean we had fans there we sold a, a great amount of merch every dude night. everybody i saw had a but, guar shirt on their shoulder at least you yeah know? but it was just like it, when you looked out in that crowd, like I saw, I came back to the same place we played in Bristow a couple weeks later to see Pantera and uh, Lamb of God and shit. And it was a much different, like, I was like, right. oh, fuck, like, this place is full, you know? Right. And uh, so, but I don't know. I don't know. I guess Mudvayne just didn't have the draw to, to really fill that place out. I don't know what they did on the back end, like if they made money or not on that. But right, um, right. I'm sure they did, but. When you get to that point though, you can make that decision. Do I want to sell out clubs or do I want to play to have full arenas? And for yeah, some how, guys, like, yeah, what was the it, difference? A, like, how did you feel about that? I mean, I like what's your answer to arena. that question? It was great. It was great to play it, you know. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I think if I if I had that choice, it's I think playing in front of a half empty place is a bad look, you know. Yeah, so yeah. I would have <laughs> I would have like chosen, it. yeah. I mean, even Iron Maiden, I think, did that in the '80s or '90s when, because oh, a lot I'm of people sure. may not remember that all these bands, yeah. like Priest, Maiden, Sabbath, had huge yes. downturns, like at at a certain point. Yeah. And these bands that are playing like stadiums now, at one point, will were doing that, then went back to clubs and had to rise back yeah. up. So, I mean, there um, was still probably just as many people there as there would be on a packed club. But it just it was spaced oh, yeah, out a thing. lot, yeah. you know. Uh, I mean, is cool. there an in between you know, for Guar? 
because you know i usually see the i usually see the irving plaza shows in new york and you sell that place out every time and that's it's like you're kind of like capped at there you know yeah the uh that's, that's pretty much it it's it's if war could hit like a 15 to 2000 seater every day that would be probably preferable you know right uh because i think like when it hits like three thousand, it's a little bit sometimes it can be light depending on where you're at but um it's just a matter of where those venues are and if they'll let guar play because there's still a lot of places that just don't get it they don't get the spew they think it's going to destroy them i mean right. sometimes we'll play these shitholes where everything's fucked up nothing looks good and they're up they're up there like hanging plastic like oh my god they're gonna ruin it's like mm-hmm. you always walk in and go, oh, we've played way nicer places than this. And they barely heard anything. You're like, you guys are freaking out over nothing. Like sometimes you'll see people up on 30, 40 you guys are professionals. And, yeah. You know, and, or they'll think that we soak like they'll they'll be covering up like everything backstage too. And it's like, you know, we don't even hose our own gear, right? Or at least we try mm-hmm. not to. It happens, right. but you know, it's like we're not buying fifty, sixty thousand dollar mixing consoles every day. Like mm-hmm. we're not gonna break your stuff. But we try. Sometimes you try to break, break everything? <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Depends on where we're at. Depends on if we ever want to go back or not. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Aren't there some clubs on the like let's not play here ever again list? Yeah, there is some. I mean some we have to tell them like two or three I'm not times. asking which, which ones, experience. but <laughs> yeah. Harpo's, that's a big one. God. I've never been there. No. I played, wait, in Detroit, I played at the machine shop in Flint. No, that was in Michigan, not in Detroit. Where did I play in Detroit? I forget. Anyway, Dread. Dread's in the chat. Where did we play in Detroit? Um, let's get to some chat questions. Let's change it up a little okay. bit. Okay. Cool. When did you first meet me, Dave? Oh, Okay. So, yeah, I guess this can also go back to the start because I know you asked me a question about meeting the guys and, and getting introduced. I don't think we got super far into it, but like I said, right. I like to ramble. But hey, I like first time meeting, it. first time meeting Dave, uh, sure, it was New Year's Eve. Um, I'm trying to think of the year, it was like 99, 98, 99, 2000, something like that. I can't recall. It was a so there was a Dave Brocky, it had to be 90s, because it was a Dave Brocky experience show on mm-hmm. New Year's Eve at Twisters, which a lot of Richmonders will call it strange matter, but you know, back then it was Twisters. And so it was, I think it was Ultra Bait, DBX, Lamb of God, and Lamb of God was still a local band at this point. Um, I don't even think they'd been on a tour yet. Are the priests? You know. Yeah, they would. I think they had just changed their name, so I, I'm not even yeah. sure that New American Gospel was even out. But um, uh, which on a side note, watching them play, like I don't listen to that style of music, but the first record I really liked. But uh, seeing them, I was like, this is the best fucking band in Richmond, you know, mm. hands down. It was just like the, I've never seen. They them. were tight. They sounded amazing. Uh, it was just like no other band had that cohesion, and they were really fucking different so back then they they just stood out so it was no surprise that uh, as big the as first, they are but anyway the first the time DBX i saw game. guar sorry uh the first time i saw guar lamb of god was opening i think they took them out for their first tour ever but i missed it because i was there late so that's my lamb oh, of man. god story womp, womp. yeah so twisters was uh it's a new year's eve my grandmother had just died like she had died that night and my friends were coming to pick me up and uh and i was just like i don't want to just sit around the house and like mope and be sad you know i was very upset about it but i was just like let's let's just go out so i'm like i'm bummed and shit so we go to um go to twisters they're checking ids and i show the guy my id i'm underage and the yeah, dude at the door the same just, age <laughs> the dude at the door just goes and he's, he's like, it's New Year's, you're good. You know, and just nice. gives me the 21 and up mark. And I was like, oh, hell yeah. So I go in there and start drinking beers. And oh, no. And uh, Dave and Dirks and Brad Roberts are there. And um, Dave is in like red pajamas, 
like a red uh like with the back door and everything you know like the little mm -hmm. the cartoon pajamas <laughs> like from a just, christmas story yeah 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 i mean fucking completely red and he just stepping up on stage and he just jumps up and goes i'll fight anybody here and i just was like I, you know i was probably already four or five beers deep and i was just like yeah so i just like ran up to the stage and he jumped off the stage and jumped on me and we just started like wrestling around and i remember i picked him up like i was a strong dude when i was a little you know and uh <laughs> i had him like over on my back like so his legs were like here and his chest is here and i'm holding him up sideways and i fell backwards <laughs> and like body slammed him and he just got up and it was just like oh that's enough that's enough that's enough and he just ran on stage and it was just like one two three and he just started the show and i was like oh what the fuck was wow. that you know that was just the weirdest thing so i when i joined the band i even brought that up i said like, hey man do you remember new year's eve and he was just like what are you talking about <laughs> yeah and i was yeah. like what <laughs> that's just every like, day you remember me, yeah 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 i was like do you remember jumping on this kid in the, the fucking mosh pit and nope just another day did uh brad or dirks remember it the first time but actually like you know i don't know i don't i think because because they had to set up all the gear you know mm -hmm. <laughs> rocky was just kind of like along for the ride until it was yeah time yeah perform, yeah you know uh so i i think i had met them kind of later on um intermittently through shows bumping into each other uh stuff like that we weren't like acquaintances yet you know we weren't like friends and it really wasn't until Corey came along and uh Corey was my wife's friend from school right they had actually met in summer school uh and i had my ex-wife in summer school so it's like so we had same two summer school summer school experiences no no different <laughs> yeah. one there. because i was we were just talking about it the other night i was like was the worst thing that ever happened to me and then she was like well that was me going to summer school was almost the best thing that ever happened to you because right I right this whole yeah yeah day. so anyway i knew corey uh his band also practiced like in the same uh little complex that Men's i had Rhea. a band yeah mens rea was like a couple doors down from dysphagia war torn we were like on the next row over it was antietam and u.s brass and you know we'd all see each other and hang out so when it was time to record, Corey had uh, the studio down the street. So we just went down there and did an Antinum record. And, and he was really cool. We got along really well. And, um, you know, I was kind of... Oh, kinda, he produced I, one of your bands. He recorded one of your bands. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, gotcha. And, you know, it was, it was always kind of standoffish at first because we had some mutual friends that were so like, you just go talk to them. Just go talk to them. You can talk to them. It's okay, you know? because mm -hmm. you know when you see these guys in big bands you're like well he don't they don't want to talk to me like i'm just right. nobody but Corey was really cool and gracious and he's a, a good host and so then i just started going to all the shows meeting all the guys mm -hmm. that way like Corey, would be like hey this is dave this is brad this is michael I'm like hey so they kind of already knew who i was um in the years leading up to uh joining the band well i mean when i joined the band before i joined the band he knew everybody you know i've been right. to the flower shop talked to brad a whole bunch you know it was a very incestuous relationship you know from the start yeah i hear i mean if you're a, a musician in richmond virginia i think it's i've heard it's pretty small circles oh yeah yeah it's definitely definitely like that now well then i don't know yeah everyone's talking to each other hello bo have family woohoo uh we're all gonna miss dave now we're gonna miss you well he's still here <laughs> yeah i'm still yeah i appreciate it though i mean and yeah that was i always yeah. thought that i got really lucky joining the band when it came to uh the comment section like as far mm -hmm. as like fan hate you know because it's like oh yeah were you expecting a lot of backlash i was expecting a lot you know coming in and you know we there were there were moments you know that were pretty shitty but i thought it was pretty light for the most part and then of course when the exit uh thing happened i uh you know i wasn't expecting anything really but mm -hmm. i didn't see any comments like good you know like i'm glad he's gone right. 
Oh, I didn't like him anyway. It was all overwhelmingly positive, and that's why I, I was just like, I think like, Man, you were pretty well accepted in the community, from what I gather. The Guar and, fans are just the best, man. They really are. I mean, they're the fucking weirdest. All you guys are really fucking weird, but it's the best, the best ever. I can't imagine, like, no other band I've ever been in had the same family type of. I mean, there's got. I was reading the comments earlier. They got when we were talking about people being in flatus i mean the the, the mm -hmm. fans know so much minute you know of the minutia information it's it's amazing it's really cool <laughs> yeah that's funny well i think <laughs> I, I think i did i think i did show this off first but yeah yes thank you usually yeah. i'm the show and tell guy and i got some more show and tell don't worry okay We're just cool. getting started um what school you went to in virginia brent that's if you care to share. Oh, I went to uh, Patrick Henry High School in Ashland, Virginia. So I've got a Patrick mm -hmm. Henry diploma, which is a PhD, which is actually false. I just like to tell that joke because it's like every everybody that graduated from Patrick Henry uh, as a PhD. But I left school <laughs> my junior year and uh, graduated through uh, some type of weird homeschool program. So my exodus christian schools huh. and i can assure you that i'm i do not prescribe to their religious choice it was just a, a, a way to get out early so i graduated a year and a half early oh wow well yeah. that's i hope that was all the information that that uh person wanted to know <laughs> yeah uh what's your favorite cover to do live with guar born in the usa you did Born in the USA? Oh, Are you I don't remember. Um, What's that one? I mean, uh, I know the song, but I've never heard Guar play it. Is that it? Are you fucking with us, Humongous? Not that I... Maybe. Um, did you have any cover songs that you wanted to do that you put in, you know, that you didn't get to do in Guar? Or was there any discussions about... No, because about uh, Guar was such a weird... Uh, amalgam of music i i never really liked playing covers in in guar uh, i kind of agree i just never like yeah i mean like i had fun doing everything we did musically but um when it came picking a song or something like yeah like we talked about let's do it and i was like no 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 like motorhead's a sacred thing and and like the band would do for example uh um not gangrene everything's ugly or something wow what the fuck um, what's the guar cover everything's disgusting oh yeah the Deglo abortions isn't that disgusting yes right 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 and they were like so i remember when that came out i was like who the fuck is this band that i didn't yeah i didn't know them either would be cool enough to have guar play one of their songs you know it's like that guar wouldn't play any human songs you know but yeah. but i mean it was fun. I mean, like we did the AC. It started with the uh, us doing them consecutively. Started with that AV club thing. Well, and, yeah, those uh, were fun. We, those were cool. Yeah. And when we did, I think the my favorite one was really doing Baba O'Reilly by the Who, which came completely. That wasn't planned, right? So we we were got we were doing Get Out of My Dreams into My Car right. or whatever. And in the process of, of playing the song, you know, we're trying to make it hard rock and metal and stuff and picking up all these different chord progressions and stuff. And then at one part of the song, it has the same progression as Baba O'Reilly. Mm -hmm. So while we were just jamming on it, we just started playing that part. That's and Dave cool. was saying it, you know? Yeah. And it sounded so good. We were like, let's just keep that in there. Let's, let's do that. Like, that was amazing. And then, and plus to hear it, you know, as one of Dave's like final recordings too, you know, I'm, I'm almost glad that that's what sad, like just tear or teared up, like just thinking about it and hearing mm -hmm. it in my head because I have a, uh, cause everybody in the crowd would smile when you'd play that song. But as soon as you hit that teenage wasteland part, I mean, everyone in the crowd is like, yeah, everybody's getting stoked. Yeah. Everybody knows that song. So we were playing yeah. it in Edmonton. Crowds going nuts. It's the it's the crowd surfing, jumping everywhere. 
there's a girl in the very back and I could just see her clear as day. And she's going, no, what are you doing? Stop. Like she was so upset what? we were playing this song. And it was just so funny to see somebody pissed in a sea of motherfuckers having a great time. And we were having a good time on stage. And, and uh, it was just like, so it cemented that, that riff and that, that song for me is like, that. it's just an amazing moment. Something I'll never forget. So I, I think about that. I think about Dave, you know, vividly when I hear him sing that song, because it was like, you know, playing it in the studio. Uh, that vocal take that he, we got on that seven inch that came out. Yeah. Oh. That's him. That's him. That's him live. That's not like I got it 16 here somewhere. takes in this. Yeah. Let me grab all my guard seven inches here. <laughs> But yeah, but that was Dave in this doing it. I think he had like two takes done. Yeah. Um I I think uh there it is, right? The picture disc. Mm -hmm. There's my show oh, and yeah. tell. Hello. Sick. I, I think uh, uh Shebop didn't get enough love. <laughs> Shebop, I can't remember if if that came out with like a real recording or not. I don't, I mean, it was just an AV club thing, I think. So that, okay. So, right. We never hit that in the studio. I don't think so. Yeah. Cause that one, I think that one, I think was kind of into cool. the Ramones. Yeah. 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 That was fun. Um, well, we touched on this a little bit, but is there, where does the money go? It goes into all the costumes, right? Tell me it goes into all the costumes. It goes, a lot of it's in the costumes. So <laughs> band economics 101. So you've got six main core people. So, and the and I'd be one of the six, not now, but uh, so it was six and then people that work in the shop, right? So not all of us work in the shop, but some of us are working on costumes. Some of us are working on music, right? So we have a building to do all this stuff in. The studio's yes. in there. Uh, so, and we try to utilize fucking every square footage of this place, which is, it's it's big, but it, once you start, once you start cramming in all these road cases and costumes and, and molds, it starts to become real small, real fast. So, so we got to pay for that building all year long. That's a big one. And then, of course, uh, just equipment, you know, you it, it's so fucked up. You think like, well, I just buy an amplifier and a guitar and, and I'm good, right? I don't have to buy anything else. And then you've got like wireless gear. Wireless mm -hmm. gear fucking expires. The FCC says you can't use this anymore. So it's like every couple of years, what? you're like, I just bought this system, you know, and it's like you'll spend eight, nine, ten thousand dollars on a wireless system. Think you're good. Nope, you got to buy it all over again in a couple of years and then re replace the cables and all that stuff. So that's, and that's a touring Damn. expense. So you've got expense when the band doesn't do anything. So even if the band didn't move, you'd still have to pay for that spot. Uh -huh. So, of course, and that's where a lot of these uh, like products and everything come in, um, like selling merchandise and all that stuff. Because we've got to generate money when we're not on tour. Cause a lot of times that tour money is just paying for the tour, you know? Right. So it's, it's a weird fucking Dude, cycle. Buses are expensive just in itself. It is getting it a is bus one place to another is like a thousand dollars of gas. At least I'm sure, you know? Yeah. So that in a tour cost, that's, that's just rising exponentially over the years, you know? Mm. So, and then of course, like, and Guar has, the pay in Guar, I won't tell you exactly what it is, but I'll tell you that it's this. It was the same the day I joined as the, as the day I left. <laughs> so that doesn't go as far. Ten years later, eleven years. You didn't later. get promoted. But no, well, we all got paid the same. So <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah. it was, it was universal across the board. Uh, but that being said, tax, uh, backline drivers, all that stuff, all those people, their wages considerably went up. So I mean. Some guys you got on tour making three grand a week and some aren't even making a third of that. So it's kind of like, you know, how long do you really want to stick around for that? 
Yeah. That, so that's 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 a big part of band economics. It's tough. You know, it's really tough. And that's why I said earlier, and I'll, I'll say that forever. It's like nobody nobody joins Squar with the, with the preconceived notion they're going to be rich. Everybody, you, you know what it is from day one, and you just try your best to try and make it as profitable as you can. Mm-hmm. And because obviously, we know we're not going to get rich, but God forbid we can pay our rent. You know, that's when that's and that's what you think when you see all this stuff, when people just go, oh, well, they're just selling NFTs to fucking it's just a cash grab. It's a cash grab. It's like, yeah, take that man, cash. God forbid I have enough extra money at the end of the week to take, you know, my kids out to dinner or my wife out to dinner or something. It's like, come on, guys. It's like it's yeah. we're not rolling in it. We know what's up. We're just trying to make a living. And if we made enough money to not have to go get jobs, we could spend all that time doing guar. And, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've all tried. I tried my damnedest to do just that, you know. And there was a time when, when I was able to, uh, when we had, like, the vape money. Like, that's, that's a whole other fucking crazy story. Like, Jameson walking backwards into this ridiculous pile of money from the vape thing Mm. uh we were making enough money to pay we weren't paying ourselves amazing but enough that like for one year i didn't i didn't have another job (sighs) i just went to the slate pit every day like literally every day five six days a week and wrote music fixed gear and it was a really good time you know and uh dave is still around and Mm. that was that was amazing but you know, but even those economics couldn't have lasted. You couldn't have afforded to pay. Well, nobody would just be able to be in there that much. At some point, when the money dries up, you'd have to go get a job. Yeah, yeah. So that was kind of that was kind of that. I mean, it's it's complicated, of course. But yeah, yeah. I I'd say that was oh well. I guess to tag on to that, um, the changes in venues taking merch and all that stuff that's coming up now what do you think about that well it's always i mean it's always been that way it's it's yeah. just becoming more uh a, people are more aware of it now like i guess right uh, yeah concert goers but ever since i've been playing shows uh, venues are taking cuts uh, punk rock clubs have never really done that mm-hmm. but all this fucking live nation stuff and what's the other one it's like there's aeg and live nation and I don't really give a shit, but you can't talk shit about them. You can't say that they've bought up every venue and that they've got a monopoly on the whole industry. Because if you go up against the fucking beast and you start taking them to task, they'll just blacklist your band. And that's fucking true (laughs) as shit. Because if, if you can't play a live nation venue, you just cut off like how much, like what percentage of venues to just get taken completely off the table. You know, we were playing Live Nation uh, venues all, all across the country, but I think all of those arenas that we played, like 100% of them were all like one company. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, if yeah. you get... Uh, that that makes sense. From that, yeah. and, the, and, the ven- and the merch cut is gargantuan. It is gargantuan. And especially when you play certain places that have their own sellers, which is mm. another complete fucking load of shit. They'll, they'll have their own. So you'll pay a merch person to be on the road. A venue will have merch, their own merch seller who's getting paid no matter what. They have no mm. incentive to sell more. So right. they're just gonna, they're just, I don't care if I sell one, 10 or a hundred shirts and they're just, I'm not saying these people do a bad job and you know, right, I don't right. want to talk shit. Cause I know some, maybe there's somebody that's like, I do a great job and maybe you do, but I can guarantee you, you're not selling the same way that whoever we've employed to take on the road can like, I guarantee you they can, they can get you, you know, three to one in some cases. And it's yeah. fucking true because you learn a rapport with the fans. You learn a rapport with the band. You know where everything is. Like, uh-huh. it's, there's just the rhythm to it that people can get. It's crazy that you, like, stuff you wouldn't think about. Like, when I started a punk rock band, it's like, I'll just sit back there, drink some beer, and sell shirts. Like, no, a professional merch seller can outsell me. Like, it's it's crazy how that stuff works. So it's not just selling T-shirts. You know, that's, that's a whole job in itself. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. 
Yeah. Yes, and and the tips go to the the merch person, not the band. Yes, yes, and they absolutely should go to the. the merch yeah, exactly. Person. I don't know why there was any confusion about that to begin with. Yeah, I think that was like some other band guy commented, and I don't. <laughs> I'm glad he got That's roasted fine. for it. Yeah, 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 good, good. How do you feel about this? Um, a lot of the elder scum dogs think that. You know, once the people who basically started Guar kind of retire, is the next generation, which would have been people like you, are gonna are they gonna carry it on? Do you think? You know, because the economic you know, situation doesn't really change, are they gonna just kind of throw it in? You know, at some point. Well, there's not. I mean, as you can see, there's really not a lot of young blood entering the picture. Right uh and as far as the the end right <clears throat> i'll just be very candid about that part this part so like everybody in guar that's in it now that was in it that's gone they all want it to end with them and that's no bullshit you know like they mm -hmm. might not all tell you that but every single person wants it to stop when they quit and that's true for all the guys that aren't in it anymore as well i mean that's why there's been such a big point of contention and i don't think yeah. there's anything wrong with admitting that you know because just just be truthful but um i wanted i wanted to see it go on right but when we talk to the guys in the band uh i always was like well what are we going to do how is it going to change and are we going to hire like we should like I was always saying, we should start getting some, uh, some, especially when the COVID thing happened. I was like, we should get some pinch hitters, some guys that can play guitar, play drums, play bass, and just have all these dudes waiting in the wings. Because what happens if somebody gets COVID again, or or gets not even not even yeah. COVID, but just sick to the point where we can't do the show? Like, are we going to cancel ten shows and go bankrupt? Because I mean, if you lose ten gigs. You, you think, well, you're just not getting that money, but no, you've already paid for it. You still got to keep your crew on the road, the bus, all that stuff is paid for. So you lose a shitload of money just not playing a gig. Right. And no, you when can't we, uh, the show, man. No, no. When we, like when Bishop got sick on yeah. one of the tours, we I were remember, like talking about. Because you took over. Yeah. We were like, we cancel the show. I was watching them on Instagram. Like, Thank you, Matt. <laughs> Oh, they were they were talking about playing some uh, backing track, and I was like, "Don't do that! Like, that's just going to be so lame." So it's like, "Don't cancel the show. Don't play the backing track. I'll I'll do my best and try to sing it." And um, and we we had a good time doing it. But the whole point was, we should have other people kind of grooming them to be the next phase of Guar. And I right. don't think anybody really liked that idea. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, uh, when we would have the conversation of when they're going to be everyone would have a different answer you know so they couldn't really ever come to to terms on what the end should look like or if there is an end because mm -hmm. i can't speak for everybody sure. uh, i don't know exactly everybody's thoughts because they haven't discussed them and that was kind of a point of contention with me as well was uh well, well what am i going to do you know i'm at this point where you know, I'm, I'm turning, I turned 40. I was thinking about the future, you know, all that shit. I was like, so yeah, and I got 10 years left where I'm going to be jumping up and down, you know, like yeah, yeah, I can yeah. do that on stage. That's how I'm I feeling can, right now. Yeah. I can still fight and fuck really good. So, so am I going to spend those last five to 10 years doing this? And it's to, how's it, is it, is it just going to fizzle out? Are we just going to play mm -hmm. the last show and be like, that's it? Is somebody going to die? You know, like, how is it going to play out? Yeah, because you were the young guy. That, yeah, so to not have that answer, it was it's kind of scary. It's like, if, if I roll this thing to 50 years old, I, I'm not going to start another band again. Mm -hmm. I mean, or I'm not going to start another punk rock band playing in dives again, that's for sure. Right, so, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. a real, that's a real thing to consider. Uh, mm -hmm. not, I'm not saying that you can't be old and play punk rock and play rock and roll music, but I'm not going to be getting in a van at 50 doing it the same way I can do it now. Right. Yeah. And, uh, so I'm always looking at every record, like, 
this is going to be my fifth, sixth, tenth of 20 records, right? And they might be looking at it different. You know, they might be saying this record might be my last record. And I think that's why we all have different uh, outlooks on on the importance of each record as well. And I think because mm -hmm. it, it is where it is in our careers is all different, you know? Yeah. Um, okay. Again, I have like a thousand jumping off points there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Let me ask you this. Since I know you seem to be an advocate of new characters, young blood, what happened with Volvatron? <laughs> Because I know, was into that, that was... idea, you know, especially, you know, with uh, from a fan perspective, the OK, here's the way I, I liken this. There was a kid who died in my high school and the next day we came in. The classroom that we had with him was all rearranged so people wouldn't be staring at an empty desk. It was kind of like a misdirection. And I felt like in in a good way in Guar, it was like, well, you can't replace Dave Brocky. So here's two new people. So you don't know where to look. And I was like, great. So I'll see if I can briefen up this story in the most <laughs> nicest way possible. So right. uh, I saw somebody earlier in the comments asked if there was um, bad blood. There, there's no bad blood. That's you know, we all get along now. Uh, it, it was a rough patch for sure. So when we so we had we wanted to bring back a slam Minster type character. Right. For, forever and still do but it's just really yeah. complicated because it's like how do you find somebody that checks all those boxes like danielle did that's that's a really tall order when you when you start it's breaking like it replacing down odors what, yeah man when you when you really break it down to what she did because when you think about it what well, we just need to get a girl in the band that's not what it is yeah. slamenstra danielle had danced she could dance she had all this these tribal moves she i don't know if she studied it but the fire dance thing worked really well she did the miss electra show she was yeah. a talented performer she was in the actor. guinness book of world records i think for the longest flame or something like that wow and she yeah. could uh and not only could she do all those things on stage but she could help build them off stage so right. where do you find somebody today that can do even 50 percent of that it's 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 tough so we got uh Volvatron. I knew Kim from playing in bands and stuff like that. She the, lives the in the Kung next Fu town Dikes. over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I knew <laughs> Kung Fu Dice before she even joined that band. Oh, and okay, cool. It, and they were they were great. That. They were. I just funny. know they looked really they cool. Yeah. Yeah they they had a really hilarious stage show and and it yeah. was it was a fun gimmick and when you look past what it what it was it was clever it was really clever but. So we, I was like, well, let's, she knows Dave, she knows us, let's bring her in, let's talk to her and see. We interviewed a couple people. And she's a clothing designer and, too. Yeah, and I don't right. think we were even knew that at the time, but maybe. Hmm. But anyway, so it works out. She's she's kind of got the most, I guess, gumption to, to really take it on. And then uh, we get out on stage. Well, the shit starts before we even start to her, right? This this article comes out that that we got a female lead singer. I remember and, that, yeah. And it was like the whole band shocked because we that's not how it was hired, how she was hired. It was like we may have an opportunity to do some backup vocals. It would be cool to get you to sing too. Not like mm -hmm. you're gonna be a singer. That wasn't part of the deal. Right. And uh so I don't know. I don't want to go get into speculation on how that article came to pass, but we all have a theory. And so we were just like, but what do we do? Do we, do we, do we, do we make a big deal out of it and squash it? Like, cause that would just cause a shit storm or do we just let it roll and we'll do the tour and people will see for themselves what the character is, and what the character does. So we were just like, let's just let it go and we'll just roll with it and we'll, we'll do the tour and figure it out. So we did the tour and Kim was really excited about the gig. She did her best and we just didn't, it just wasn't the mark where we wanted it to be. And uh, so we just decided to let her go. And, uh, you know, mm -hmm. drinking was part of it. 
And that really, mm -hmm. I don't think really ever had to be mentioned. And like, we got into like a big spat online where me and her were like talking shit or something, but you know, Oh, I don't remember uh, that. Oh yeah. I believe yeah. Me you. And her, it was like Facebook comments going back and forth and, um, it was stupid and it took, it took a little bit of time, but everybody simmered down and calmed down and we're all, you know, it just, it, it didn't have to be negative and, and it just didn't work and it wasn't going to work. That's, that's pretty much right. the end of the story. Well, I guess the conclusion question would be, has that soured them from trying to look for new blood, you know, since then, because there hasn't not, been any, not exactly. really ex you know, okay. It, it's made us a little bit smarter about, uh, mm. I guess you could say contracting, right? Um, mm. Like, cause when you, you gotta be very clear about when you hire somebody, what is the duration of this hire? You're like, are you in the band perpetually or are you in the band for this? And I think we didn't say you're in the band forever. So, I mean, mm. that's why I think she was kind of shocked when we weren't going to take her back out again, mm. but we should have, it's, you'd hate to get contracts in this business because it's just like, you just want to talk to, you just want to right. play music with people. But in the, at the end of the day, it really does help people define what they're doing. So, I mean, maybe we should have had uh, a contract with her, you know, cause everybody's relationship with the band is a little bit different. You know, like me, uh, me, myself, Matt, uh, Dirks, Brad Bishop. It's like, we're all owners of the band. So anybody Gordon. else that's come in before or after, yeah, Bob Gordon, they're, so the six, the core six, everybody else has been hired, right? Right. To, to do the tour. So, you know, if we had like, like a, my buddy played bass for a couple shows when Casey was there. So I was at that New York show when you guys just passed the bass around. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. Yeah. So it was like, and then stuff like that. So, yeah, any so anybody else that you see on stage, and I'm sure it's going to work out with whoever takes my place for a little while. It's like mm -hmm. they'll they'll be hired per tour until the joining of the band. Yeah, but I can't yeah. speak for what they want. But that's sure. just kind of the way it's worked so far. Um, this is sort of a <laughs> we already know, but do you know who's replacing you? <laughs> I don't know if you're officially allowed to say anything, but it's been, it's kind of out there already. Did we lose him? Oh, I think you muted. I think you're muted. Uh-oh. Can't. How about this? Can I uh, kick you out of the room? Oh, right. wait, I think you're back. Right. There you go. Yeah, I think you're my uh, uh, died. Yeah, that's fine. Well, um, is this fine? Can you? Is this working? Yeah, yeah, I can hear it. Um, cool. It's fun. It's funny that as soon as you ask the question, it's like, oh. Uh. <laughs> I know. I was like, oh no. No, I, I do know those. who it is. Yeah. Yeah, I think. I mean. <laughs> um i want to say who it is but i i know I kinda, you i i don't want they, you to because i know i don't want to get anyone in trouble nobody's but... told me yeah nobody's told me not to say it but they but okay, i don't even yeah. know if man knows that i know but, oh really uh, well i mean yeah if anyone watches don's show <laughs> you know yes i can i can confirm that from what the sources i've heard don is correct right yeah. um well that's awesome because um if it's that person, they were a guest on my other show before that Guar tour happened. <laughs> yeah, man. So I mean, fuck it. If everybody knows who it is, I wouldn't just say it's Tommy, you know. But uh, yeah, it's because uh, I know you were yeah, nudging yeah. him into that position. Um, I know I heard you say that on your uh, on Instagram live, but also on stage. You want to tell the story about how you kind of snuck him onto the stage? Oh yeah. Well, it's like so. With, with me knowing that I'm gonna go right, so it's like yeah. I wanted to leave the band on great terms, and and part of it was like I really want to help you find somebody too, and uh, so we went through a couple. Like I called some friends of mine, and you know, 
I'd say, Hey, do you want to try out for this gig? I'm, I'm leaving. Guys would say, yeah, yeah. I'd love to try out. And I'd say sick. All right. Do you have a guitar with a Floyd? They'd say, no, I'm like, man. <laughs> and then I'd be like, you can't do what I can do. Like, come on, man. No. You know? So, uh, not to say I'm a fucking amazing guitar. Player. I had, there's, there's tricks that you can do with the equipment. You know, there's tricks that you can do with the fucking Floyd and all that stuff. And it's a part of the sound because Corey did it. Pete did a little bit, you know, it's like, you mm -hmm. gotta have Floyd Rose, wah wah pedal, and you gotta be able to throw those two things in there. Very the maximum checklist. I think so. Because it's like, cause yeah. I, cause I, cause I could tell like when Zach would play, he would try to do like the Pete, Wawa thing you know and mm. then when i would play it was just like that's exactly what i wanted to do it's like i wanted to be like pete you know pete lee mm. and uh so yeah so with with getting tommy when i when i would talk to these other guys like there was another there's some people in richmond that i wanted to talk to and they just it's not just playing guitar that's the whole thing because i think I, a gajillion people can do what i can do on guitar like that's not i don't think that's special can you do this and can you act at the same time because you kind of you have to and, and then a mask too and, uh, yeah and so the first person that really came to my mind was like sean from ghoul because it's just like it's it's in the family mm -hmm. they get it they know they know what it is and then everything everybody else is like a stranger you know so, but when right. we started doing the tour with cancer christ I would talk to Tommy and, and hang out with him. And, and I told him, I was like, Hey man, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be around after this run and they're going to need somebody and you should start talking to the guys and, and let's get your name in the hat, you know, and see what you can do. And he was like, immediately, I, you could tell he just wanted to bear down and commit to that idea. And I'm glad it's working out. You know, I hope it works out. Mm -hmm. Time will tell. And of course, <clears throat> when you hit the stage that's really the that's the test you know yeah and and i knew he could perform and i liked yeah. the fact that he could act and he did music for one of my favorite shows uncle grandpa and oh, cool. uh, that was so that was cool so i already i already like love the dude to death yeah so he's and he's got a really good attitude and that's and that's super important too because i look at these fucking guar guys like my older brothers in a way to where like I don't want to be around them all the time, but I'm still mm -hmm. really protective of them. Like I just want them to do well and, and be successful. So it's like, and you got to be please cool just on tour. Yeah, it's like please don't just be able to hang is like part of the job. Be able to hang, have a gr have a really good fucking attitude, and hopefully like be able to reinvigorate the band. Because um, you know I was getting burned out. You know, it's just yeah, sure. I don't, there's no great way to say it, but it's the way I felt, and. But when I came in, it was the perfect time to like take the band up a notch to bring some excitement in. And I really mm -hmm. feel like I did the job that I was made to do in this band. Like I, I think carried yeah, the band through, through Dave that. leaving mm -hmm. and, and helped transfer in uh, Bishop back in mm -hmm. and all that stuff. And that was all really pivotal. And uh, the, the timing it, I'm not going to say that the timing was never fucking right to lose Dave, but the timing was right, right with me. The energy level was, was good. Mm -hmm. I think all that stuff worked out the best way possible to make the best of the, that shitty yeah. situation, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree with all of that. I think. Um, yeah. And that we'll talk about actual music soon too. Cause uh, yeah, yeah. I, you know, that's important. But I wanted to say, if Guar, if you're watching, this is a testament to that if you start a Guar podcast, that maybe one day you can join the band. Because I don't know if you know, but Tommy was part of the original crew who created the Guar cast. Oh, yeah, that's that's right. That's right. Because he was, he was in the Manx, that. like back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Guar, I can't be your beefcake the mighty because I'm, I'm not big enough. But like if you could create a new character for me, you know. I could do something. That's what Just that's what Dave told me, right? I I asked to be Beefcake before when when Corey was still around. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. And he just looked mm -hmm. at me and was like, "You're not fat enough." And I was like, "I can eat right. some cheeseburgers, dog." 
Yeah, I need a different character. <laughs> but, I can't live up yeah. to the the girth. Yeah, well, I'm definitely glad I didn't do that because I'm not a bass player either. You know, I'm right? Saying. I mean, I, yeah, I, I yeah. can, bass, but I'm a guitar player. Right, right. They had a lot of those bass players who were guitar players for a while. I think both Jameson yeah. and Todd. Yeah, and it it doesn't work. I mean, they 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 mm -hmm. can. It's it's one of those things where like a guitar player that plays bass. You can play all the notes in the song. Those guys did, but there's a different thought process behind the instrument, and it's and it's just fucking really hard to explain, because some people just hear it and they go, "Well, I'm hearing all the parts of the song in the song," mm -hmm. but if you're like in tune to a rhythm section, and it's just it's not the same. You know, it's like I can't tell you why one drummer is greater than another but if i listen to the two i could be like well that guy's clearly better right so mm -hmm. if you i think if you hear a real bass player beside a guitar player that plays bass you'll you'll notice the difference pretty fast yeah no disrespect to those guys because, no no they, totally they, they did the gig i've played yeah. bass in some bands too you know i did it to the best sure. of my ability and shit but but right. i'm not a bass player yeah yeah i mean mike bishop he's a bass player He's a bass player. That's what's great about him uh, and Casey mm -hmm. is they, they both have completely different approaches to the instrument, you know, more than just one guy plays fingers and one guy plays with a pick. Right. It's just, yeah, yeah. Uh, God, I love playing with Casey so much because it's just a born bass player and he's a meat and potatoes guy. There's not a lot of flash involved. He's not, you know he's confident in the position it's just I, it just works like what he does yeah. it, it's it's all the thing like you don't have to tell him what to play because <clears throat> because yeah. sometimes you're like writing riffs and you know some some bands will go through and say well you have to play like i'm playing these notes you got to play these notes with with a bass player a real bass player you just go i'm playing this and you just listen to it you don't you don't look at it and say, Oh, I got to play th that exact thing. Mm -hmm. Like they just do their own thing and it's great, you know, Bishop. And then you, if you gave Bishop and Casey the same song, they would probably come up with two different ways to play it. it each would be totally cool. Yeah. And I love that they're in the band together. Um, yeah. 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 yeah it's, it's, Cause you know, it's like I grew up on like, Bishop sound and then my first, my first new Gua record that I ever bought was Ragnarok. So, you know, that was straight into the Bishop era. Uh, the Bishop me, stuff, yeah. I loved like that, that, that scum dogs thing. And then, but there's such a contrast because it's like, because when you get Casey, you also get Pete Lee. Yeah. And yeah. To, that's a whole other era. And from, for me, that's like the one. Like when I think about what I want to do in a, or what I really like in a Guar song or a structure or something, that's what I go back to is, mm -hmm. is Dirks, Pete Lee, Casey, Brad. Like that just was such a, a cool chapter. And that's what's yeah. really neat in the band. It's like everybody has their favorite period, you know, and it's so cool. It's just like a comic book series. Like I liked it when Todd McFarlane was drawing it. I yeah, like yeah. And they're all good, but it's like everybody's got their their ones they like a little bit more, you know. Do you have a favorite, or did you have a favorite before joining? That's it. It's it's Pete, Casey, Brad, and Dirks. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. it was this so Toilet like, Earth is like my favorite album of all time. So there it is, right there. Yeah. So for me, it's like it's Ragnarok, uh, mm -hmm. Carnival, and some people just Carnival. really hate Carnival, but I love it. It's it's such a weird, expansive. Yeah. Yeah. Like it, it's like no songs got left on the cutting room floor for that record. That's that that's <laughs> exactly what it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's why it's so fucking cool. It's it's just like it's it's back in the day when you you didn't skip songs. You put a you put a cassette on, and you just played it from one mm -hmm. end to the other, and you listened to it. So it you had all these ebbs and flows. It's not like today when where the attention span is so short. You know the band would never make another carnival and maybe that would be a good thing. But at the same time, it's like, Sammy is a cool fucking song. You know, I really <laughs> wanted like, to see your, that the version of the band with you, I wanted to see like 
do like five more albums and reach their carnival. I wanted to see what your carnival would would have been like. I wanted to do it for forever, but back to when I said like some people have different uh, opinions on where the albums are falling in their career. Well, I don't think you were there that... yet. Cause it was yeah, the yeah, second, yeah, but I don't. It was the second record with a consistent has, band. I don't think there's. There's a lot of there was a lot of apprehension to do experimental songs because it was just like, and I understand. Sure, sure. Management and producers and everybody's you got to make this record and it's got to be great start to finish and and I'm just like thinking about it when, when we're writing it and I'm like, do you do you know how terrible the music I listen to is? It's like <laughs> why am I why am I trying to write good songs when I listen to like. Like if you go to YouTube and look up worst band ever or something like that's the shit that, that I'm hey I'm in that like band it's Green Jello yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> right so it's like I, you know that's this terrible stuff is good there's there's charm to it but yeah it, you know I'm just going on I'm rambling again. yeah yeah but, this you know, is great because really, I, I do want anything by anything no I want to actually but, get into like the actual records that you made now <laughs> so this is a good segue sure um, sure. Have you, did you feel like that any of the records you made with Guar reached the potential of what you wanted to do with Guar? Is that a fair question? Well, I, mean, I know I you, have, I, I know have, you kind of personally yeah. didn't like Battle Maximus very much, or you had some issues with how that album came about. I have to say no on all counts, but uh -huh. there's a really big but. And that's uh -huh. and that's only because I never got to make the record with Dave that I wanted to make. You know, that's that's what it that's what it really boils down to. Mm -hmm. So it's like I don't know that even if we would have done our opus, that I would it would have ever held a candle to the potential one I had in my head for that. You know, yeah, because um, we all got robbed when he left sure yeah and i mean you would just join the band you didn't really get to create a yeah. new album with them you kind of joined an album in progress more more or yes, less right it, exactly so so maximus was kind of a a rush you know it was like we got to prove we can still do this and i'm sure if you've watched the documentary you've seen there's always mm -hmm. that sense of urgency in the band to kind of like mm -hmm. we can't stop we have to do this we have to do this oh, and that i was, got my i got my yeah. props yeah cool Thank God they improved the cover. What the hell were you thinking with this? I'm sorry, but <laughs> you know, it, got you on it's the cover hard to. Time. I think Guar. I think Guar was on the characters were on the cover so much they were trying to try one without it. That was sparse. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it was cool watching them make that. That you know, because on the front of the record, that the sure. Guar logo is, is a sculpture. And the sculpture's oh, really? hanging in the kitchen. Yeah. Oh, great. Great. Well, I'll, I'll show the new Matt one because I like it. Yeah, Matt made that out of... Um, yeah, That's Matt cool. made it out of... Um, That's like... Um, I can't remember the, the material, but... That's like but America Must Be like Destroyed. This was, a, this was a real sculpture as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Look at that color. Um, Look how fucking cool that shit on there you know oh america must be destroyed love america must be destroyed. that's what you need on a cover look at yeah. all these motherfuckers and a big ass dinosaur you it know? looks cool it looks yeah. cool because it's just like they call it i think they call it like spaghetti because there's just too much mm -hmm. stuff but i like right. that you know it's, that's it's the guar. antithesis that is of guar, guar. though yeah yeah um cover art aside um yeah so i guess that, that that's a fair answer that you never got to make did you um were there plans about like what the next record was going to be with dave at all um there, i mean there were ideas mm. uh, he was definitely going down so i mean i don't ago, i still don't even understand what that record is about metal maximus or that tour or i you know <laughs> i saw it yeah. i still don't know what's happening so when we'd have those meetings with dave it was a lot of it was like, so I would show up to the office was like first door on the left. I'd go in there in the morning. He'd already be there and we'd, we'd smoke weed and 
he would tell me about all the stuff he had come up with. And I think half the shit he was just coming up with on the spot, but yeah, he had had this sure. thing in his, in his head about, uh, there was, there was an apocalyptic event that he never really went into detail on what it was, but it was like a nuclear war. And then there's a, there's another race of people living underground called the perfects. And there's some weird thing about pig children. And it's basically oh, all these battle mutants. Maximus. Yeah, yeah, and there's all these yeah. like mutant races of people, and I think he was going to continue that a little bit, but you know he didn't really get to flesh it out completely. Yeah, because I think the problem with with that record is that the story arc was so expansive. It's kind of like a skullhead face where <laughs> it's hard to put it together because it needs to be condensed, and you yeah. need input from other people to kind of do that, but. I think it was just kind of rushed and you know like one of this unreleased songs was tammy queen of the pig children right. and it was just like we're in the room and i'm like who the fuck is tammy I, yeah i still don't know and I, to be honest though i still yeah. haven't you know they put a whole description of the story for each song in the new record i haven't read it yet so oh, okay that's my that's my fault but just from experiencing it I, I I thought it was a good record, but I didn't understand the story. I think I wish I wish that everybody could have got the opportunity to smoke a bowl in Dave's office and have him tell you what it was about. Because that yeah, I'd love that. Because that's yeah. really cool, you know. But sure. unfortunately, uh, there was no video cameras running at the time. Because that would have been. Because at the time, I got it. Like I, I I got what it was about. So you have to be like really a, stoned to get it. What's that movie? I am Legend right yeah 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 sure. so you, i mean you, so it's basically like guar's take on i am legend i don't think he ever okay. mentioned it that way but that's the way I. that's kinda a good that makes sense it. to me that makes sense to me yeah okay um so i i mean i want to talk about i'm gonna i'm probably just gonna basically skip blood of gods i don't know it was a good record i thought i was a good stepping stone to the new dark ages i yeah, actually I think, think and, this is dude, my favorite record i think okay here's what i say this toilet earth is always going to be my favorite and there's a lot of nostalgia factor in that but i think the new dark ages is probably if there was somebody who's never heard guar i'd probably give them that first i think it's the oh, best awesome. album awesome I've, like in I've terms of production really and like songwriting and throughout like it's got a little bit of everything that guar does on it and it's done well and it's got that classic bishop bass sound which i love so much you know yeah so that that there was definitely a lot of concentration on making everything count for that record uh, it was and it's again it's different like making the blood of gods was again another like we have to make a record to prove we can be yeah, a band so right, there's, a, there's yeah. an immense amount of pressure this record was you guys being a band it. and being a little, little bit yeah. more comfortable with who you are with so Bishop to me it was and like me, it was like the pressure's off like fuck it we yeah. can write some rock and roll songs now and then uh i think the some guys felt more pressure than others uh it, starting that record good, was, right <laughs> yeah starting that record was really rough for me because i was in a really bad mood we had uh on the day that we were supposed to start recording it it's it we got like two feet of snow and mm. it didn't even touch the city basically they, they might have got two inches we got two feet out here the whole band got fucking stranded i told them not to come because i woke up and i saw my front yard and was like this is fucked. so i live west of the city i live close to where we uh recorded the record i'm in the same county and so 90 percent of the county lost power for all 10 days straight wow. and it was like you know fucking so that is degrees, that is the new degrees. dark ages it was we the the fucking record started on generators that's so funny we're fucking so i'm chopping i'm literally chopping wood every day because we have no power and there's no other heat source in the house so we're just burning you know wood in the wood stove and everything or the fireplace and i'm literally chopping wood until uh, a certain time and then going to the studio so i'm fucking miserable because i'm just like we shouldn't even be making a record right now we should be like 
fucking at home. I should be at home yeah. taking care of my family, you know? Right. And so I was really pissed off about that. And it's kind of funny that, you know, you watch the documentary and everybody's like, I quit the van because they made us do stuff that was fucked up and I'll never do it again. But uh-huh. they sure as hell will do it when it's not them. So, yeah, van waits for no man. Uh, we got the studio. I was like, so fucking what? Give me a fucking week. Let this shit thaw out. You know. So now we're doing the record and my head's not in the game. You know, it was a really, it was a really tough start, but we, we fucking buckled down. The power turned back on. Got it going. Um, but it was a trial by fire, man. Cause like the guys were staying out there with no power. So like I lived pretty close, so I was going home every night, but I, I think Brad and Bishop and Dirks were all sleeping there. Cause it, the, there was oh, like an yeah. apartment above the studio. Yeah. So it's like, fuck this man suffers for their art. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Wow. Well, were right. you proud of it? The, this record? What did you think oh, yeah, of the, this yeah, record? Yeah, yeah. Was it like yeah, was definitely closer definitely to like the statement you want to make with Guar than you know? Uh, close. Else? You know, it was close. It was Not there. quite there, you know, but it, yeah, it was. It was fun. I like all the stuff. I really like. Uh, man, what's the fucking song? <laughs> See, I don't. I don't know all the titles. I can tell you all the yeah. titles, right? Yeah, oh, play it. Like, just play it for us. Oh yeah. I don't even know if I know all the song names yet. Uh uh-huh. but is that I uh can't. the Beast Will Eat Itself? No, no, no. no Venom it's... of the Platypus. I can't remember. Uh uh-huh. Into the Breach. No, it's not that right. Rise one. again. <laughs> this is terrible. Wow. Yeah, so much for being the best guar record. I don't even know what the songs are. Yeah, but um, anyway, that, that like I like playing all the abstract stuff that's on there, like the stuff that you're like, oh, they haven't played anything like this in a while, you know. Yeah, the stuff that couldn't have existed in some of the earlier incarnations of Guar. That's the stuff that I really, really like, like all those weird, weird tunes. Yeah, and that's what we were, and we were just going for a mix, you know. It was trying to do something that was different, you know, really trying to not have a like there was no preconceived notion of what the record should be it was just let's take all these songs and let's and these songs that are a little bit different let's run with them and see what we can come up with and some of them you know didn't make it you know there were there were some ones that were different maybe more poppy more techno or more uh grungy that just they never got close to the finish line yeah just got left behind see that's the kind of stuff i'm really fascinated with how like what how far did those songs go? Like, were they even songs or were they just ideas? Or, you know, were there songs that you recorded that you left on the cutting room floor of any of these records? Yeah, I'd have to say for both records, there's probably about close to 20 to 25 songs oh, cool. each. And of course, they just get condensed down. And so it's like it's like a, like a bunch of layers. Written? No, like some of them might be complete. Some of them might be music with no lyrics. Uh Some of them might have a really strong idea and and you're just like, oh, this is great. And then you just start to put it up against all these other tunes. And you're like, well, maybe not, you know, well, maybe this one's great, but it's not hitting where these other ones are at the moment, you know, because it's, it's a lot about feeling too, you know, is the, is is the band feeling this one? Because I mean, I'm sure there's always like one guy, you know, that's really partial to something. And then it's just, it's not getting there and they're, and they're bummed about it, you know? And I'm pretty fucking hard about that stuff too. Like I'll get, I'll get hung up on parts and I'm like, no, 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 you can't change it. It has to be, the song has to be this way. And I'll get very dictatorish about it, you know? And, Mm -hmm. but that's what, that's the strength of Guar is the collaboration is to the constantly of butting heads until you can, take a song and twist it and pull it apart and put it back together then it becomes a guar song yeah you know? when and mm-hmm. when and you write songs some, just, sorry go ahead yeah some come oh, i'm just uh, i'm just rambling again some some come well i don't want to get all the know. comments saying i'm always interrupting my guests i know <laughs> i know it's called a conversation the uh like for example uh 
like Ratcatcher and Monster came together like that. Mm. I think Monster was written in so the real simple rock minutes. and roll songs come together quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And like the beast will eat itself, I think took like fucking seven years to write, you know, <laughs> what? It was ridiculous. Wow. Yeah. It is nothing like the beginning, like the way it sounded when we first started it was, I don't even think it has the same, the same riff in it. It was just like a snowball effect. That's interesting. And what other one that was really cool, like, like Phantom Limb on the record before that, Great that's song, one I'm yeah. extremely proud of. That yeah, was like that makes me cry, man. That was a that was a miserable song to write, uh, or at least to I get bet. to get to a certain point. Like, so we had a riff, and I brought in I think the uh, like mm. I brought in that riff, and I had a totally different perception of where it was supposed to go, and we couldn't book in anything on it. We it, we were struggling with it. We couldn't really get it anywhere, and it was one of those things where the producer Ronan Murphy was there and Bishop was real adamant about trying to do something. And that, so it was that, that's what it was. Okay. We're going to work on this song. We're going to work on this song and we're just going to keep working on this song. And so it's tough when you're in a room and you're not inspired and everybody's just like, you're coming up with chord progressions and they all fucking suck and nobody likes it. And then after a while, you just start to get a little bit of a little bit of traction and you're like, wait, okay, well that sounds kind of cool. Was this and before they keep were grinding it song? over and over again? It's like, wait, yes. Yeah. Because and I feel like the like, words really bring that song together. Yeah, absolutely. But and that, I think that was the point. I think once we got these, these somber parts in there, we, we knew without saying what it was going to be about. Like we know what this mm -hmm. song is. Yeah, and Bishop yeah. had that idea of a phantom limb. And uh, in its infancy, I don't think it was even tied to any music. We just had this idea and we thought it was a really cool concept of uh, f being able to feel odorous not being there. And it's a very mm -hmm. real fucking song. Like everything, oh, all yeah, the lyrics in that it. are yeah. just true. Just true. I mean, there's yeah. it's, it's the perfect blend of real life with Guar Mythos. You know, and that's what I really love about it. I think that's mm -hmm, probably mm -hmm. one of Bishop's one of the greatest songs lyrically he's ever written. You know, I think I Didn't think that's one of the greatest that? bar songs ever written. The lyrics, I thought I thought so. I thought that was. Um, no, they, I think they probably wrote it together. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not a hundred percent on if they don't you quote know, me either. I wasn't not. there. Yeah, <laughs> but. I thought it was Bishop. I got. I could probably look up in the notes, but um, but when we did those last two records, we all did get involved in lyrics, and uh -huh. Dirks I think was very involved in in adding a lot of lyrical content to a lot of stuff. So like I did some uh, like the way I write. If if I if I feel like something belongs to you, like a like a project. I might just stand back and be like, just go with it. Like, I don't want to, I don't, I don't feel the same way about it. So I don't know where I could take it. So I might not at contribute to something. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not that I'm standing. It's not that I'm withdrawing letting from other tune. people breathe with it. Yeah. 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 You know, cause I just, well, when you write a song, yeah. When, when you write a song, song, do you know, yeah, sorry, it. go ahead. I think we're having a, I think no, we're no, having no. a lag. Okay. That's what's happening here. Go ahead. I write a song. I'm just like, get the fuck out of my way. But yeah, and that's not the right way to be. But uh, I'm hard headed. So well, I was gonna say, it, ask uh, when you write a song, do you write it for a certain project in mind, or does it kind of like go through the filter of like, is this gonna be a Guar song? Is this gonna be like a U.S. Bastard song? Most of the time, well, U.S. Bastards has a really defined style. It's, it's right. like speed rock. Yeah. Um, you know, there's no real set parameters on what it is, but it's it's got it's it has a voice from the beginning. Uh, Guar obviously is a little bit more all encompassing. Like you can kind of put a lot of stuff in there and make it Guar. And mm -hmm. even a riff that doesn't sound like it's exactly a Guar song, when you have that combination of like when Brad plays drums on it, 
sometimes that's all it takes and you're like that's a fucking guar riff now that's kind of what bishop says yeah yeah and 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 it is you know all the guys playing together what makes it what it is but uh but yeah when i write it's I, i don't think there's any like one way of doing it yeah so sometimes i'll just come up with a riff and i might float it past the guar guys and it might not work and then I, but i might still dig it so i might church it up and do something different with it use it for another band uh actually you know what rat catcher uh i wrote the music for against the grain i was trying to oh, do okay. something with with them and uh are you still in that band or no 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 they uh okay. well they they broke up oh okay at the beginning of the pandemic so that was like our our the, the tour that we were supposed to do with me playing guitar as a full-time member the the whole thing got thrown out oh. because of the covid shit but so i didn't I write I the saw full them once open for the meat men yeah oh yeah yeah they're great so i didn't write the full rat catcher music i just had right. like the main riff like and i played it like a whole step down or something and i had a couple different parts and then but when it was time to do guar uh the guar record i think i was just fucking around with that riff in the in the studio like just kind of mm. playing because it was like a warm-up song for me and brad just goes man play that play that play that so we just me and him jammed on it together and then it's like all right well now it's a guar song you know so that's yeah. kind of all it took was me just playing something and him hearing it well, it's just fuck around with that and yeah. then the guys left the studio that day. I think the next day it was just me and Brad. And that's when we finished it. Basically we got it pretty much like 99, 95% there. That dude's a machine. Yeah. Brad, Brad is very underrated. I think nobody talks about him enough, especially on this new his, record. His drum parts really shine through. Yeah. The, the, his drumming is amazing. Mm-hmm. Just the, the sound, like when I, when I would write music being younger and I had all these like preconceived notion of what the beats would sound like in my head and I try to explain them to other drummers, uh, it was a lot of it was like the, the guar sound, you know? Mm. And so when I fast forward, when I write my first guar song, you know, I, I play the riff and I already have it in my uh, head on what it's supposed to sound like. One? Yeah. And then as soon as Brad plays it, I'm like, that's the beat in the head like that's what ex- mm. you're playing it exactly what i'm thinking so I'm, so i was nice i was meant to be in this band for, yeah. <laughs> for a little bit yeah yeah it just worked man it just worked it, it, i love brad's playing me and him yeah. got along really really well on the last couple of tours you know nice so let's uh here i got some questions and comments from like over an hour ago that i haven't even gotten to yet so let's go back sure to the sure comments. yeah i thought that was a good flow i didn't want to ruin it um are the guys also their own techs how did he uh opening the u.s bastards and then pull out pusty for the next set i don't know if that's the question but there's a general idea in there yeah so i i, I Double think duty. i got an idea what he's asking um when i started the when i started in guar yeah we were still doing everything on stage ourselves like we were stringing our own guitars uh, we were setting up our own amps, pushing everything on stage, getting everything wired, right, wiring our own rigs, going out there before the show in our cl- plain clothes and turning our amps on and going, all right, it works. Cool. Make sure my wireless works. And, and we're fixing all these fucking problems. We had a we had a tech, Gibby, who was kind of doing like some drum tech monitor type stuff, but it was very much no standalone techs Mm -hmm. and i think when that started to finally change was around 2017 when we were doing the warp tour and we got some dedicated guitar techs and a lighting tech and all that stuff because the big reason was the way warp tour was structured i was like we can't do a tour like that and still do all our own shit at the same time. Mm-hmm. Like we're gonna have to have some dedicated people just to do the changeover on time. And because it was right. tough. I mean, back in the day, I remember playing huge festivals 
and everybody would take their costumes off and fucking push the rap and everything up, trying to get it off stage for the next band, you know, and Guar did that for years. And you know, they I don't think they'll ever get enough credit for fucking really making it happen. Yeah. Well, I always think of that uh when Dave I think it's a Dave quote when Lemmy came to see Guar and was like, I hope I never have to work that hard. <laughs> <laughs> probably it's like yeah yeah, yeah no kidding um, yeah i mean there is something to be said about having text i mean it's it's good because on tour man you really should be focusing on the art on the performance yeah, that's the idea and i think right? yeah but it's just a uh it's just a wild ride for many many years drinking and being fucked up and it was just a big party so it was like so it didn't even really feel like work it was uh -huh. it was like we had he had to take a break from partying to wrap a couple cables for a little while yeah so right it wasn't on. that bad but i uh i don't know what this means but can you explain the black heart war ghoul guitar yes so the black heart war ghoul guitar uh i had a friend chad pettit who started a guitar company and i befriended him when that company was kind of new they were doing all like these cool crazy shaped guitars and he had he had a guitar we had gotten one made when i was in cannabis corpse hmm. and then a couple years later I'm like, dude, you know, I call him and I say, God, I got the Guar gig. I'm in Guar now. It's like, we, we got to do something for Guar. So that we put our heads together and we drew up the war goal shape. And uh, so that was kind of like a hybrid of a guitar that he had designed and we had designed it together. It was a really cool collaboration project. You know, I, I wish we could have kept doing it more because there were some things i wanted to change on it but it was just like 27 frets single pickup now i like two pickups and i don't mm -hmm. need that many frets and the scale length is different on the guitars i play now but when he did that guitar he was moving his production into korea and at the time korea was the, the factory that they were being made at was making esp Dean, uh, I think they were making Schecter's, LTDs. So they were really fucking good guitars. Now the guitars that came before that and the ones that came after that, eh, they might not have been as good. Mm -hmm. But all the guitars that came out with those shiny finishes, the, the poly finishes, the the glossy stuff, the V, the Wargle, I can't remember the other models or whatever, but all those were really good guitars. But uh, after they made those 12, Chad ended up selling the company to some other people. And we didn't see eye to eye on the, we didn't have the same vision. So I just left and uh, went with him after that. Nice. When did you first play guitar? And what was your first guitar you ever bought? Well, the first guitar, um, I started playing guitar. Well, I, I got a guitar at 13. I basically held it for two years and mm. didn't know what to do with it. Uh, when I was 15, I finally started taking some lessons, which really was just like a guy showing me how to play songs and play some scales and stuff like that. You know, so it's not like I wasn't formally trained in music theory or anything like that. I know it all now, but I didn't back then. So, the, and the first guitar I had that I learned on was a Yamaha Pacifica. I still have it somewhere. Nice. Um, I've actually got one of Corey's. I think I've got Corey's first guitar too. Holy shit! Um, that he didn't. That his family didn't want. It was. It's painted. You know, it's been painted real. It's unplayable, but mm -hmm. <laughs> it's hanging up in the other room. Sure. So, and then so yeah, Yamaha Pacifica, which is a great fucking starter guitar. I played it for years and I didn't know how good it was, you know, at, at the time. I just thought it was a cheap guitar. And then um, I have, uh, I bought a Dean Flying V or I bugged my parents and they gave me one for Christmas a couple of years later. I think maybe then I was 15 or 16, but I just, at the time I, they were like, 
we're not going to get you this shit unless you're like serious. And I was like, I'm fucking serious. Like I want to play guitar. Like really, I'm going to do this. And, uh, cause at the time I think that guitar was like maybe $700, yeah. which is kind of yeah. a lot back then. Sure. And, uh, that and a crate GXT 212 combo amp. I still have that in the other room too. I just turned it on a couple months ago to make sure it still works. Nice. What was the first much. band that you were ever in? What was that? What was it called? That's I'm adding Cold, that one in. Cold Fusion. And Ooh, we, what did that sound like? Kids, it was a bunch of kids in biology class, you know, and huh. we talked about this name. And I, I had a bunch of friends that were into drawing. Uh, like they would draw out with pen, like what spray paint graffiti looked like, and and I was kind of doing it too. Uh, so yeah, I was actually a, I, I would draw a lot and paint and do all that shit before I picked up the guitar. So it was like when I picked up the guitar, all that visual stuff stopped for me. Mm. So that's kind of a weird thing. I failed art class. What? Yeah. So which is, don't put that my, on your guar resume, or maybe you do put uh, that on your guar resume. Yeah. Fuck yeah. But my well, my yeah. art teacher was a fucking bitch. She was she didn't like me because she was a punk rocker and I was a metal kid. Huh. No bullshit. I think that's what it was. But anyway, I'm fucking rambling. Again. Yeah, what yeah. What was the question? Uh, who cares? I think we covered it. It was your first band. I asked it. Uh, I oh, think we kind of yeah, covered yeah. this. But, and, I got, um, and I got kicked out for... Uh, I played the guitar like this. Like I was humping uh -huh. it and doing the dick stroke thing. And we were like fucking 15. And they were like, we don't want my mom to see you do that. So you can't be in the band anymore. Oh, man. That's not dangerous at all. Cold fusion. No, no. What yeah. kind of music was it? Uh, it was just like uh, I mean, it was I, probably like hardcore, but mm -hmm. I wanted to be like I wanted to be like Sepultura and 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 all this shit. But we did. I didn't really know how yet. You know, we were just mm -hmm. throwing stuff at the wall. Like I've got sure. a tape of a jamming in there, and it's just. I, I laughed my ass off listening to it the other day because it's just so all over the place, you know. Any but we were just fucking kids, like figuring out. No, 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 no. It was no. fucking terrible. Okay. That's yeah. funny. Uh, we kind of <laughs> like covered this. this comment, but... This is dick stroke metal. Hell yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a genre. Um, were there... Are there any actual recordings you guys did that didn't make the albums? I guess I'll refine this question. Uh, well, Tammy was one that was well, that's one of out Dave's now, yeah, yeah, twos. yeah. Okay, uh, there's Pustule Lust. What, yeah, so the that's Pustulus great. has another song. Um, which album was that for? That's New Dark Ages. Mm -hmm. Um, I wish that there was some fucking there's some bullshit going on at the end of the recording session where it was like we can't work on this song because we have to finish these other songs and mm. i don't think you know me and the producer i love ronan to death but we did not see eye to eye on that song mm. and at least during the recording process so i kind of felt like really rushed doing it and i think it's fucking hilarious i think it's really funny but there's a couple parts where i was like man if we would like the song is the comedy factor i think is like an eight out of ten i mm. think if we were to fucking like just tweak it a little bit it would be a fucking 10 out of a 10 like it'd be amazing but oh, i want to hear but it, it, it is what it is it's still fucking yeah. funny as shit i, I, I mean i was uh i loved bored to death and i was kind of disappointed we never got to hear that live uh we we played it live did you play it um yeah we played it i think on the first tour after the record came out really Maybe I and just I maybe fucking, I went to the bar. <laughs> I begged and pleaded them to fucking bring the torture rack out and to make a big mm. drill to play the song. And we mm. didn't. So but that's that was kind of a bummer. I was really disappointed. Cause I wanted uh Blothar and another character to, to be torturing somebody on the rack while I sang the song. So when we, we did sing the song. I love playing the song, but it mm. was just like with no action to a song that screams action was kind of a come on, man. Yeah. 
See, there it is. I can't can't please everybody. Yeah, it's okay. I don't feel like you're cutting me off. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, here, I, this is a good question, and it's a jump off to another question I have. Do you have any favorite sure. show that you've played? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I I could probably probably remember more of the bad ones, to be honest. Um, but I had a lot of, I mean, a lot of shows that were great. I mean, one of the sonar, uh, sonar, sonar in Baltimore, I think at the end of one of the tours, uh, we were doing these, uh, the, I guess the nude encores, like we were taking the costumes off and, mm -hmm. and playing, uh, cool place to park. Right. I remember oh. at the end of that one, it was, I think it was the last show of the tour. I'm just in my loincloth. And at and Matt's spraying uh, the crowd with the bus saw, and I just got into it, and I just put my head in the middle of the. I just got sprayed with guar blood and got it all over me and everything, and got it all in my hair and shit. It's just like I was feel I was fucking feeling it that night, you know. Mm. So that was that was a really good show. I just right. kind of was, you know, that was like the celebration of Dave type of tour because mm. that that was the first one that we'd done without him. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, my and the jump off to the question I wanted to ask is, do you feel like you had a favorite moment in Guar uh, for you or your character? And I have one for you. So let's let me see what you say first. Uh, what did you say? So like, just like my favorite moment. Yeah, or, not necessarily a show itself, but just like that, that right there, that was awesome. Uh, I mean, there's lots of just really good. Or times, maybe your favorite you know. contribution to Guar or the Guar universe, you know? Uh, well, I mean, I think my my contribution, or at least the way I like. I know that I did what I did to the best of my ability and I, and I carried them through times. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a team effort all the fucking way, but I think, and also I knew when to leave because I, mm. I, I was feeling burnt out and I, I started to feel like if I stick around too long, I don't want to bring this thing down because I'm just not feeling it, you know, in the same way. And so that was, that was, I think that's just as important as fucking, you know, cause I got no right to mm -hmm. fucking make everybody fucking miserable and shit. I, I don't know if yeah, I was doing that or not, sure. but I know mm -hmm. I can be hard to get along with, but so, but my favorite moments really were a lot of the fucking Brocky isms and shit, you know, like a lot of the Brocky fucking chaos, you know, him telling me I got the gig in the band mm -hmm. and I driving home, uh, like when we drove, like I was driving home in my little green pickup truck. And fucking he calls or Mike Dirks calls and he says, Hey, we've just, you know, he's real soft spoken sometimes. And he's like, we, mm -hmm. we decided to use you for the, the fall tour. And that was how I got told, right? The first time we've decided to use you for the fall tour. Very diplomatic. Right. I hung up the phone when well, I hung up, you know, beep, driving. And then it's like, Hey, this is great. And then fucking like a second your phone rings, it's Dave. And he was like, Hey, you know, he's yelling. And I was like, Hey, what's up? You know, and I'm like, Hey, what are you doing? It's scaring me. And he's like, Hey, did, did he tell you? I was like, no, tell me what? He, yeah, he told me I'm gonna do the tour. He's like, Yeah, you're in the band. And I go, Well, well he told me you were the tour, mm -hmm. right? And he's like, No, you're in the fucking band. I was like, I'm in the band. He's like, You're in the band. And nice. that, that's that was a just moment. a cool fucking exchange. He was so stoked about it. Like he was really like, you know, his energy level was so high and it felt so fucking good to be. And I was like, can I tell people? He's like, yeah, you can tell people you're in the fucking band. And I was like, oh, sick, I gotta go. Bye. And nice. So I got, yeah. Home. You know, it's just like, Eve, Dave called, told me I'm in the fucking band. You know, it was, that was cool. That's probably one of my favorites. That's you a know? good moment. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Can I tell you my favorite moment? Sure. Yeah, yeah. And I want, and then I want to hear what it was like for you to experience this. 
that Lincoln Park joke fucking oh, killed man. me, dude. <laughs> and I was like, yes, that is exactly what Guar is. Like, they're a mirror. They're, it, they tell the truth, but it's funny. And it's a little bit inappropriate at the timing. But, like, that's what Guar does. Yeah, it was... Uh... It was funny because it was I... true. I had to fucking make the joke. It was too fucking good to just, it was just, you know, it's an apple that's just hanging on a tree. And all you got to do is, is just get it. Yeah. You know? And I, it and was I knew, nobody else, I knew nobody else was going to do it. I knew that it was going to get, I knew exactly the reaction it was going to get. It was going to get groans. It was going to make people nervous. I felt nervous about doing it, which means I, I, bet. I definitely knew it was right. So I was like, yeah. if it's making me a little uncomfortable, then I know I got to go for it. Did they know you were going to do it? No, no, I don't think so. So there was, was a surprise to them? That it was like a genuine reaction on stage? When they oh, yeah. Oh, That's yeah. That's awesome. I remember some of the guys thinking it was funny at first and then being really fucking nervous afterwards. But, you know, th there was dude, really no it's guar, I mean, dude. There was it was there was some shit talk in the comments and people were upset, but for the most part, people fucking got it. But I mm -hmm. tell you what, the side note to to making that statement, and I've always wanted to say this out of costume because I'm not gonna sure. say it in fucking costume, and that's the whole thing. When I'm wearing that shit, I'm never gonna fucking break the character. I'm not gonna peek the mask up and be like, well, actually, mm -hmm. but I'll tell you now. I, I'm not a fan of Linkin Park's music, but I watched a lot of videos of that dude performing after he passed away and before I even made the comment, just to kind of be acclimated with wh what that was. And man, I've got a lot of respect for him as a performer because to perform, to, to do what he did on that level, on those tours that they were doing, I mean, the guy was in phenomenal shape, took care of his voice. Mm -hmm. That's a tough performance, and I got a lot of respect for that. And so it's kind of fucked up to to have all this backlash. Like Guar makes the joke, and then, but people don't know that I've. It's like I don't really feel ill will towards this guy. I just I gotta put some humor in the situation, yeah. so I have respect for him. But I'm not like I said. But I'm not gonna come out and be like, sure. Well, actually, I got a lot of respect for this guy. Yeah, yeah. I'm like no, that'll come out in in due time. But you have to get because. Guar should not apologize for shit ever. They should, they should put it out there. And if it fucking offends somebody, then deal with it. You know, you should take yeah. it. I know it's a different climate today, but where you have to be a little bit more thoughtful about some of the things that you do and say, and you got to really think about not just what it means today, but what's it going to mean tomorrow because shit changes so much. Mm -hmm. So you can't really be, as wild off the cuff i think but that one was perfect so thank you I'm it glad was you, i think like yeah see so i want to just say like that's what odorous used to do all the time you would just talk shit and it's it's like yeah the yeah. whole joke about guar is that if you're offended you're offended by a bunch of dude like characters wearing rubber like the joke's on you Guar supposed to be villains. Yeah. See, I'm seeing a comment now, and I like I like this comment. The Lincoln Park joke wasn't any worse than the joke at Pops in East St. Louis right after the Michael Brown riots. And you know what? You're right. There was a lot of fucked up shit, but the difference was oh, wow, I'm way behind on the, comments. <laughs> it's the it's Sorry, the guys. internet and that's all right. It's the internet and social media that made that stand out, you know, because it was like like, because even when the when we had the internet, if something was shocking, it would still take a while to make the rounds. You know, you'd have to share videos with each other through fucking email and stuff. You know, there wasn't really like I remember when Blabbermouth was a was like a almost like a message message board. I think oh, Blabbermouth was called Metal Update hmm, back I don't in remember the day. That, yeah. Oh yeah, it was just you go to it. the. It was just like two or three words, not words, lines on a website so it'd mm -hmm. be like <clears throat> judas priest gets new guitar player what well, not back then but whatever it that those mm -hmm. would be the headlines you know and that's it it wouldn't be a story connected to it it's like that's the news so uh 
and then over time it was clickable links and now and then it turned to blabbermouth and blah blah blah. Good time. Well, thank you for the blabbermouth the, yeah. uh history. Yeah. <laughs> Listen. Yeah. Wow, there's a lot more comments than I thought. Uh sorry guys, I've just been really into to the there's a lot of talk about different guitars. Let's see. Uh, trying to pick out the questions. I'm, I'm listening. Here. I'm just going to grab some out the fridge. Yeah, go quick. ahead. Are you still good? I know we've hit the two hour mark. I always like to check in. No, at, man, I'm having, two hours. I'm having fun. Uh, okay, cool, cool. Um, okay, now I'm way too behind. Do, 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 do. Okay, you guys got some gear questions. What's the Holy Grail Marshall setup? Uh, see, I can't talk gear, so I'm going to just let you take oh, this. Thing. Holy Grail Marshall setup back there this one right here so this is my favorite of all time the jcm 800 the 2203 2204 style amps i think that's one of each up there 50 watt and 100 watt model um that's what i took not those specifically but i took that that amp on tour with guar for the last since 2014 i had a marshall 2203 amp and that's just my favorite sound of all time uh it's just nice. like that that through just a regular marshall cab you know I, I mean i like a lot of different speakers but i can kind of get along with any of them as long as i have the right head so that's right just give him the right head <laughs> the same year that hunter first rented the dairy i in, i think we're eight, like eight? pretty much exactly yeah. the same age so yeah i i always joke that i was born with guar because Guar started mm. in 1984, technically. Yeah. And yes, that means I'm going to be 40 next month, everybody. Yes. Oh, hooray. Uh, TS9 into the front. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Tube screamer right out front. That was that was the main sound in Guar the whole time that I was in it. Right. Can I okay, I don't know what that means, but I'm, now I'm interested. Yeah. That's so, some inside um, baseball, huh? If you you can still find it uh fucking YouTube. So I <laughs> so I made a band, right? Called uh it's a it's just a fake band. I was learning how to use Pro Tools and I think I remember the this. only the only way to, to get good at something is to do it. So I was just writing songs and I wrote a song, uh I made a band called Steel Clinton and I wrote made another band called Lead Kennedy, like Mm -hmm. Steel Clinton's song was called Super Nintendo Chalmers. Hmm. Led Kennedy had a song called Steve Jobs, Lou Dobbs, I'm a Dina Jod. You can search all these up. They're they're on YouTube. I remember still. the song and about then, plumbing or something about like and then hating yeah, your customers. Yeah. I remember so this that is one. like way so I so I had this idea to do a band like nuclear assault, but I so I wanted to do two different ones. It was like I wanted to do nuclear assault. So mm -hmm. like a George Bush themed thrash band because he <laughs> liked to say nuclear. <laughs> right, right. Then, no. Yeah, I knew I knew and a band then, called the Nuclear Power Pants. And the, oh, that's awesome! So mm -hmm. then I I came up with Sexual Assault, and I made this like fucked up logo and and I put all these weird like I tried to make it look like an old Doom cover, like a like a Doom punk rock cover or something. So like I had like gandhi on there the dalai lama and like a hooters girl and all these protests mm -hmm. and stuff just like random mishmash stuff and i had two songs piss boner and rape hammer and rape hammer became the cutter uh many many years later but rape hammer was the initial idea and i don't know that why they didn't like the they didn't like this idea but when the fukushima power plant melted down it uh the song was about Fukushima melts down, the radiation goes up in the air, it rains, it rains on a rapist, and then a rapist has a hammer in his hands, and his rape gene becomes fused into this hammer, kind of like Chucky, you know, and so the, he dies okay. now. The, so now the hammer is the rapist, and the rapist, uh, or the hammer rapes somebody, and they have a bunch of baby hammers. And that's, it's stupid. It's like, it, the song is like 60 seconds long, but that was the premise of, of what Rape Hammer is. 
And then, well, so <laughs> we do the cutter, right? This, yeah. uh, I wanted to keep calling it the hammer, but not rape hammer. I wanted to, or to have mind control device, which is a hammer. And Guar would basically use it as a tool to open your brain and control your mind like joysticks, like with a video mm. game. So mind control would be very primitive. My fingers are in your brain. And it's a very like no destructo plot. Oh, I loved it. I really liked that yeah. idea. And I just, I couldn't get anybody else to jump on board with it. So, well, now that we've ruined the algorithm completely, <laughs> everybody like oh, this video. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I, we just said rape like a hundred times. I'm just like, uh, whatever. not that I, I mean, it's Guar Pond. And I, of course, that's going to happen. But now can we get Lizzie Hale to sing Rape Hammer? <laughs> Is that ever going to happen? Dude, I know about this algorithm thing. I told, I yeah. went for a week on Facebook, decided to fucking just go for it. And every person that was a dickhead in like comments, uh, or about whatever, because I, I always talk about guitars and amps and shit like that, and all these yeah. groups. If somebody says something that was cynical or that, that wasn't helpful, I would just go, go fuck yourself. You know? <laughs> and just, I did it for like a week. And I don't want to be like really facetious about it. I just thought it was funny. And then now nobody has engaged anything I've put out in the, <laughs> since then. So I'm like, oh, dude, I've been like shadow banned. Yeah. I guess it's real. I didn't know. But whatever. I don't give a shit. It's social media. It's not real life. Yeah. It's more, yeah. Here's more about unreleased songs. Um, do you remember like anything about yeah. them? I mean, any, anything else shine through for you from like the stuff that didn't get? Uh, there was one cool idea. Um, we were trying to do a song called, uh, well, it really didn't have a name, but it was like Mirror Mirror. And uh, it had a lot of cool parts and a lot of cool, like, harmony things to it. You know, it's hard to describe unless you just kind of heard it. And, and it was a song that wasn't, you know, it was still kind of in its infancy, but it had a, it had a theme and it had a hook and it just, never got there you know it mm. never just got a hundred percent and uh i think everybody in the band we all liked it but like i said it was just one of those ones that comes up where if we didn't have a lot of stuff we probably would have kept working on it but when you take right. 20 yeah. and you say all these 20 songs are cool but then you condense them to 10 and you go well maybe this 11th one is still cool but it's not as cool yeah. as these 10. So you just kind of have to make those hard choices and let them go, or at least right. not let them go. The, the The band still has uh, we got a bunch of hard drives with just all these practices and jams mm. and shit like that. One day maybe I'll archive them and put some of that stuff out. But oh, that'd be awesome! I I've would. Got copies uh, of I would. A lot of that. Yeah. Um, Actually, here's one I still need to give back. This is Guar Live Multi Track. I don't Ooh. even know what fucking show this is. Is there? This is prob that's probably. Was there a, a lot of recordings of like the shows and stuff? Because I, I figure it's easier to record a show now than it was, you know, twenty years ago. Yeah, yeah, we we actually do. We have a lot of live shows kind of in the bank, and um, we wanted to do like that fucking thing. Like uh, maybe it was Grateful Dead or Fish, but it was like. They're like, wouldn't it be fucking cool if you could walk out the door and buy the CD of the yeah, show I've that done you that. were at? Yeah, like, that I have would some be Pixie killer. shows. But yeah. we couldn't. Uh, we couldn't quite. It was a lot more work than we had anticipated. Like getting it done, and you know, we want it to sound good. And yeah. and plus, with Guar, it's just, there's just so much. There's so much of a chaos factor during the show. Like you, sometimes we'll be like, "That was a great show," and we'll go back and see see a video of. I can't even hear the, the words. What the fuck, you know? And or we can't talk, or we can't sing because uh, we're fighting something big, right? You know? Or if somebody gets hit with blood, and the guitar goes. Burr. It's it's yeah. almost like it almost wouldn't be enough unless we could put the video of the show with 
the audio. So yeah, that's sort of a yeah, that's the thing about Guar Live Records. It's just like they I think the only one without a video is live from Mount Fuji, really. And uh you just wanna see it. Yeah. Um this is my brother. Do you have a signature guitar and what items did you specifically want on it? Yeah, well, yes and no. I have custom guitars. So like the signature guitar, mm. um, the Wargo that we were talking about earlier, uh, I really just wanted like a shape. I didn't know enough about like the technical things of uh, guitars. I mean, like I knew what scale length was, but I didn't know why what made one really different from the other until a couple of years later. And then I really started to get in tune with, um, like I played Jackson's in my metal band and then I'd play like Les Paul's in my punk rock band. And then it, it took a few years to, for me to really figure out, well, I like this one better, but why? Oh, the scale length is shorter. So it, the notes bend easier. So that's why I like this one. Or I like stop bar tail pieces because of, uh, the extra slack you get and the slack has to do with feel too like with bend with bending and shit i love using vibrato mm. instruments so um the two guitars that i played mainly were like some dean's dean custom shop stuff they didn't ever do a production run of them uh it's not spec wise it's it's the same as like any ml that you would get it's 24 and three quarter scale I think the only difference on mine was the headstock obviously was a straight six. I got shark fin inlays and I believe the boards, the fret boards were ebony, but, and they were also mahogany guitars, mahogany necks with maple caps, which were different than I think some of the guitars were just straight mahogany. I don't think they did a maple cap, but the, the reason I wanted the maple cap was uh, I'm a Les Paul guy. I really like the, the sound of Les Pauls, the feel. Uh, that's a big that's a big thing so I, dean did a great job in making that and then the last two guitars i got at the end of the run were uh from a rob a guy named rob makes guitars in fucking god why can't i remember the state rob from Radical, the united states yeah. <laughs> well he's in uh what's the mormon place utah Yes, he's in Salt Lake City. Yeah, like and, that's uh, how he played, punk. Yeah, he also played guitar in Toxic Holocaust for a while. I think he still is. Mm -hmm. They're on tour right now. But he builds guitars, radical instrument products. Um, I actually have one of those right here. Oh, let's see. Yeah, yeah. so he built this one. I wanted like a snake skin. And so he did this one similar specs it, it's got he does guillotines instead of uh the shark fins i still have the same scale length as the deans and les pauls 24 and three quarters uh gotta have at least one with a floyd i've got another one that doesn't have a floyd on it and this one yeah this one does have an ebony board as well i'm not i don't give a shit about like ebony rosewood it's to me it's, it's a visual thing i don't prefer mm -hmm. one or the other sound wise but when you do like painted guitars i like ebony if i have some natural finished guitars uh that have like burst or whatever i, I want to see rosewood just because it's a little bit lighter but yeah there you go so this is this is a good question because i wanted to elaborate on it as well but the pusty character did you have any say in the character development? And then I guess, how did you develop it as it went on? Uh, yeah, so so me and Dave sat down and uh, he went through kind of like a list of potential, uh, potential names. It was like a, there was like a necrop, I don't, I don't know if Necropolis was one, but I know there was a Bubonis and there was all mm -hmm. this fucking different, uh, just different names of potential Maximus characters. And, yeah, uh, and they use some of them, I'm sure, for the uh, the aliases on Battle Maximus. Yeah. Right? Like uh, yeah, Zach yeah. was Splatus Maximus. and Yeah, and he, and he had some other ones that weren't ever mentioned ever again. 
and I, and they were they were all kind of strong contenders. But then when he said Pustulus, I think him and Matt were like, "This is the one we're kind of leaning towards." And mm-hmm. when we just kind of looked at the character or just the name, and here's the the visual we're thinking, I kind of just saw the two together and was like, "Yeah, this is Pustulus. I'm going to be Pustulus. Like that's that's it." So it kind of felt like here's a bunch of choices but everyone wants to go with this one. So it just seemed like a strong idea. It rolled off the tongue. It just, it just, you didn't know what all of them meant, but you kind of, you hear pustulous and you're just kind of like, He's you kind of know what that is. <laughs> yeah. It's just a gross. Yeah. Dude. So the, the, um, the character attitude and voice and all that stuff. It was kind of like, it was Dave's idea for him to be deaf which is really fucking hard to keep up with. Like, so that just kind of went away. Yeah. So I didn't, just... I didn't know that was supposed to be a thing. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it was, was that uh... like, did you try to make that a thing for a while? Yeah. Well, he was like, so he was like, Pustulus is deaf and he's in <laughs> constant pain. Deafulous. And the only thing that stops the pain is playing guitar or mm. rubbing elephant cum in the wounds. And I oh, was like, well, that wasn't made clear. Like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, I'll just play guitar more than uh, so we don't have to do the other thing. Mm-hmm. And so when we did like, so the deaf thing would really only come about in the interviews and stuff. And like I said, like, that's why he's like, I had to do them with somebody to make it work, you know? So it just became a really hard gimmick to get. Like, I would do a couple yeah. and I'm like, man, that interview wasn't funny. I didn't have anything to go on. Uh, we got to come up with something else. So it just became hard of hearing. And after some time went by, like that initial voice was just like my first pass at, at getting that out there. And it wasn't until like maybe another year or so where Pushless kind of had a. Um, I kind of feel like the attitudes went with the masks, you know, like Mm. they're like the punch just was a little more goofy in in the middle. You know, I think towards the end, he was definitely a lot more mean and, uh, and sour, you know, not as uh, very dark and not as comedic, you know, I think that the, the previous mask had more of an ability to show to emote to show emotion and that was really i think important at the time because it, it, i think that's what made it kind of funny mm. was was i was able to be kind of a little bit more of a goofy character and stuff like that uh that's what i really liked about hunter in techno because of those in and, and dave's mask as well because uh if you notice just looking at odorous like and all throughout phallus when he makes these facial expressions, I mean, they're great. They fucking yeah. really like. He can be mean. He can be scary. One of my That's favorites. What I don't is like, like about the full masks. And... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then when, even though Hunter didn't have a mask, the way he would paint his eyes. So when he mm-hmm. would open his eyes really wide, he it was just a very cartoony, yeah. Yeah. fucking cool look, you know. So that's really important to the characters to be able to emote. Um, I think. Yeah, that's a pretty good answer. What was it like touring with Hunter back in the band? And that was a lot of since, fun. You know, you were probably one of the only people on that tour that hadn't toured with him previously in some other incarnation. Yeah, yeah. So. I, I liked it because he fucking really gave it 110%. Yeah, he did. You know, it was... I'm glad that they finally were able to put a lot of that stuff behind them because the the fall i mean people just fall fall out you know and people have their mm-hmm. differences of opinion and stuff like that and that's fine and i, I would have hated to have seen them hold that grudge for so long mm-hmm. and and a lot of it's communication like it just they had to communicate to each other to really to get past that and i'm just i'm so glad they did cuz you know i didn't i don't have a dog in a fight you know i can't right. repair that relationship sure i wasn't there but did you um, know him at all before that had you ever met him? No, no, he was one of the only ones. I don't think yeah. I met him. Uh, I've talked to him at a at a meeting or two, 
but mm-hmm. nothing real serious uh until we did the live stream and when he right. came and it was just it was so fun working with him for that you know because because i did a, a don even came and did a short tour with us and like hmm. i loved i liked you know despite like he might not think we get along we just don't get along politically but i like don you know and uh yeah that's I how i feel he, about I think, him too <laughs> i think he's fucking funny as shit like he had i love watching him talk about guar like i'll watch him endlessly talk about guar you know yeah he uh we're not that far apart politically but we just yeah but anyway uh okay he, uh, <laughs> but he just he thinks we're pretty far but anyway um but yeah anyway i i just i like the old characters sure. I wish yeah I yeah more with i mean i love seeing it you know i saw two of those shows on that tour uh except he wasn't at one of them because he had to leave the tour every time i saw that yeah, tour, someone was gone because it first it was casey was gone in new york and then you came back and hunter was gone that tour was fucking hard man and me and bob gorman got sick on the last oh we got sick when we got home mm. so we all we both got covid in new york yeah. i guess oh and man so we, yeah. we loaded out we went home it Next wasn't my day, fault bag of shit yeah <laughs> no, it's okay uh what was it like working with lizzie hale are you a house storm fan uh no i'm not i mean i i really respect what they do mm-hmm. uh, but I, i'm not a big fan of the music i actually i really do like that song love bites i like the the, the vocal melody on it's like fucking killer but that's that that stuff's a little bit too bright and happy for me for the most part but clitoris maximus right yeah i mean (laughs) i had the the melody she sang on the song was i wrote the melody on guitar and she just kind of emulated that so i didn't really work with her hand in Mm. hand too much for that she kind of did her own thing but as far as talent goes i really think that like you know how lady gaga was like way up there for many many years in, in the pop realm I think that mm-hmm. fucking Lizzie Hale is just as talented, and the only reason she doesn't have that same recognition is because she's doing that work in rock and roll and mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. fucking pop. Sure. Yeah. You got like, I mean, like Taylor Swift, you might not like it, but I mean, it's fucking huge, you know? Oh, yeah, that's I undeniable. Think, I think that artists like Lizzie that can, they just check all the fucking boxes. I mean, like, I was just like when I did my research on her, I was like I was blown away by what she was capable of. Still to this day, it's like I'm, when I see an artist that's just genuinely that fucking good, I'm I'm, I'm impressed. So yeah. busy, I'm very impressed by. Cool. Uh, what about uh, what was it like when she came out and played with you? I missed that show in New York, but I I saw some video. I'm sorry. What was that? One more time. When Lizzie came out and actually performed with you guys in New York, yeah, that was what really was cool. Like? Glad, was it cool? She, glad she did it. Yeah, she was really stoked about it. You know, she was yeah. very. Uh, she didn't give it, you know, a. Uh, you know, I, when they came backstage, I was like eating lunch. I think I was like shoving Chinese food in my mouth or something, and she came over and said, "Hey," and I was like, "Oh, the last time I talked to you, I had all the shit on." So. Mm. Right. So that was cool. I'm glad. Uh, yeah, total pro. Total fucking yeah. pro. Maybe Guar should have a celebrity on every record. That's like a new thing they could do. Anyways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, what rhythm channel is yours? Do you have a left or the right on the record? Uh, they, they probably switch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they probably switch. I can tell you that if it's a weird guitar sound, it's probably not me uh dirks is way more experimental uh i love his experimental stuff i want more of that yeah he's uh he definitely he just makes noises yes he takes a lot more time to think about like what else can i do with the guitar to where like i'm more of a meat and potatoes kind of guy you know like i don't do channel switching i don't do like clean and dirty I do all the changes on my guitar. Like if I do a clean part, like even on the record, I'll roll the volume back on the guitar and play clean that way and then turn it back up to do the dirty parts. And Dirks mm. has like 
he picks a f- crazy like landscape for the song so it's it's really cool to have that dynamic to work with so it's not just because it was two guys that tried to make noise or two guys that only did like meat and potato yeah. stuff it'd be fucking boring. yeah sure yeah. yeah it's a good balance for sure um thank you see balance it out with a compliment i'm i would love to have pete lee i have talked to his people about it but you know what at this point i kind of want to wait till i see the x cops which will happen in march so after that tour I'll, i'm gonna i'll be on him about it uh cool. Pete's great. what was it like seeing the x cops come back like did you have any uh were you a fan of the x cops or oh yeah 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 definitely, definitely. like the x cops Pete lee fucking... coming on tour with you what was that like were you uh comparing notes or well i had all these like there was a bunch of times where i met pete before and i and i might have only gotten to talk to him for like five minutes right like i'm right. gonna like i know he's gonna be in and out of this room so i'd i'd go hey man what's going on and then i'd sit there for a second and go so how do you play the part in you know and try to get him to like here yeah. you go show me a guitar and so i i did that to him a couple times you know before over the years and uh so, but when we did this last tour it was really cool we just to fucking sit down and just talk to the guy for real you know and actually have some just some one-on-one time and real conversations and stuff like that mm-hmm. uh, and just and just being able to tell him you know that like i love your playing you know because like i just because you can tell people like oh i love your record or i love your band and you know half the time we hear it so much we're just sometimes people can be like yeah yeah that's cool i appreciate it but i know when you really love something you're like no but i really like your band you know or i really love your guitar playing so that's what i wanted to tell him like no i'm not just yeah i'm not just paying you a compliment like i really fucking dig it so and he was he took it genuinely well and you know he's telling really you love carnival of chaos <laughs> yeah 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 I'm you sure know and, it, it, and being in the band with Dirks, i probably didn't didn't get the chance to tell him that enough you know because we were more like peers right. at that point and you know but Dirks, i love you buddy love your playing as well you're hearing it here on the guar pod yeah. uh what celebrities would you like to see get the axe on stage at a guar show who do you want Guar to kill? And have you had a say uh, in that? Yeah, well, I mean, we all kind of spitball the ideas out. You know, obviously the strongest one ones will stick. Uh, shit, I think, I think now, Machine Gun Kelly would be good. Kill him. Mm. Yeah, he uh, let's see. You know what? He's he's a fine actor, but like Ed Sheeran. Ed Sheeran. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. It's like Trump. Trump was good, but he's like too easy. Uh, yeah. And I think I think the, well, the president's the given. They always killed the president. I think the reason that Guar has kind of shifted away from the celebrity thing is not because we made a conscious effort to do that. I think it's just because pop culture moves so fucking fast that by the time we build the costume to take mm-hmm. it on tour whatever is hot on TikTok right. is not relevant anymore. So right. the at least with Trump, he was he was in the news every day. Yeah. So that that made a lot of sense. And then um, you know, because like we had we had Bernie Sanders, uh a Bernie Sanders type character with Hillary getting killed on one tour. And of course like Bernie's not relevant at all right now. At least yeah. not in pop culture right so right right hmm. <laughs> steve so i said steve harvey <laughs> i'm trying to pick out your there's a lot of talking in the ch- thank you everybody for chatting it's just it's been hard for me to keep up so i'm trying to keep up uh and get all the comments i'm like an hour behind on comments sorry guys um do you have a favorite guar song Man, probably preschool prostitute. Ooh, did you ever get to play that one? Yes, you did. Uh, the first tour yeah, I saw yeah. with you, right? That was a weird. Yeah. That was a crazy deep cut. I was like, okay, <laughs> yeah, that's a carnival I think song. Got right? a really, a really interesting 
riff, you know, and we didn't. Yeah, it's a great groove. The that and uh, and meat sandwich. Meat is, sandwich. Is Just because meat sandwich is like for, as a guitar player, it sounds cool to listen to it, but when you actually play it, there's so much going on that's very different than it's it's all the all of it's counterintuitive like how to play it hmm. and i don't think that uh i know that they played it before i joined the band with some other players and i don't think they ever played it right you know but then again i had the luxury of playing it on a computer with a uh audio program where i can slow everything down right. and yeah. I'm listening to like each fucking note you know and i'm dissecting it i'm like Okay, well, I don't know who's Pete and who's Dirk, so I'm just going to learn both mm -hmm. sides. So when mm -hmm. I go into the rehearsal space, I like know the song like inside and out and all that shit. You know, wow. so that was that was that my must strength. have been fun though too, right? I mean, meat sandwich. What a oh, that's yeah, a crazy yeah. riff, man. Cool, that's a man. crazy riff. It's cool to hear that stuff in such detail because it's like sometimes you'll even hear editing mistakes or or mm -hmm. playing mistakes, and you're like, you don't hear them uh, in the record like listening to the song, but when you're like really fucking dissecting it, you can like really pick that stuff out. And when yeah. we did uh, uh, the Scum Dogs, uh, the remaster, so I, I did mm -hmm. all the, I got, I had all the tapes in my office, like all the reels. So we, it we had all the reels except for Salamanizer. We couldn't find Oof. it. And it took, and it took a couple of years to finally- A couple of years. Bring it back. Where yeah, was it? it was, I, you know, I can't remember. It was like under somebody's fucking bed or some shit. Like oh, it was ridiculous. Wow. Like, like, and nobody in the band. So we got it wow. back. I'm like, okay, so now I have all the reels. So let's do something with this because the the film, the the tape is gonna rot away one day. So let's do something while it before that happens. And I got to take. Uh, we have a baked and transferred by a company called uh, West West Side, I think. And they sent us the reels back along with all the digital audio files. So I put them on a computer and I clean them all up and I name them and I separate them by song. So that way I can give them to a mixing engineer and have him mix them. So he's he doesn't have to he doesn't have to spend days figuring out what track is what yeah. and what a guitar is and all. Yeah. So like this is the bongo track. So that's not a I joke, I don't all, think. Yeah, yeah. So once I get it all organized, I get to fucking hit play. And now I've got scum dogs untouched, oh. unmixed, just in front of me. So I can just I'm I'm hitting the guitar and I'm just I'm listening to the guitar for Salamonizer front to back with no other instruments. And it was so cool to hear uh Dirks and Dewey play uh that's a crazy like, riff i'm like i'm like oh wow i've been we've been playing this song live for seven eight years and i've never played it like that mm. so i get to go play it a different way the next tour which is really cool like maggots and stuff i was like right. i've always played it like this machine gun and then i hear dewey play it and it's it's not like that and i'm like wow okay i'm gonna play it like that yeah so that was cool. that was totally cool Sometimes I put on Salamonizer and I pretend that I've never heard it before. And it's fucking <laughs> amazing, cool. dude. Because, I mean, that yeah. you've, as if you're a Guar fan or if you're in Guar, you've heard that song a thousand million times, right? Yeah. It's so good. It's so crazy. That riff is so weird. That's what all heavy metal should strive for. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love, yeah. Anyways was it oh the flattest shoulders and the scum dogs yes so when um, we did so when it was we a did nice the, tribute. so we were doing the the show and of course i'm trying to we got hunter back and and sleazy's gonna be there and we got uh danielle coming back and i said man i really want to do yeah. something different and right. so i so i was like does are there any flattest shoulder pads left over and they were like yeah so we still have a pair and they were fucking falling apart i mean it was I'm like sure, yeah. barely you know, but i put them on and i realized that that me and uh corey had the same shoe size so we were able to wear the same boots 
And mm. so I had the flattest feet. I had my loincloth, uh, the flattest pads, the pustulous mask. And then uh, another guy, I'd, I'd gotten a, a, an SG, a red SG from a, a guy on tour, gave it to me and ended up doing some work f- to it. And I was like, okay, perfect. So I can be pustulous with some flattest mat, uh, flattest pads that represent Corey. And I can play this SG guitar with a whammy bar and kind of throw it back to Dewey. So I'm kind of encompassing like all this, you know, past and present uh, Maximus character in there. Yeah. So, I, so I was really stoked to be able to kind of make all that stuff happen. And I even went as far as to, <laughs> when we did the fucking uh, mastering on the record, I took one of my guitar tracks and I, I pitch shifted it just a fucking hair, like, uh, like a couple of cents. And what it does is it creates this like coursey effect. And I was trying to get the effect of scum dogs, the, mm. the record, like I was trying to do it live. Cause that was like the thing to do back then. That's why when you hear the, the reissue and that guitar comes in, it doesn't sound like the guitar on the original record like there, there was some there's some weird processing going on to make it sound like spacey i don't know why but ev- mm-hmm. i know everybody in guara hated that when they first right. heard it and of course as fans we hear it, we're like this sounds fucking awesome what are you talking about <laughs> yeah well i love the re uh remix of scum dogs but i don't know the horror of yig by al jorgensen like you can't beat that one yeah did, I guess you didn't really have the multi tracks for what he did. No, I did not. Yeah. Didn't he mix another rec- uh, song on that record too? Not that I'm that aware he, of. I think it never yeah. got used or something. I don't know. You That was before your time. Do you ever try the hot sauce my company gave to Casey on the tour a couple of years ago from high on the so. I, I think so like because if if somebody gives us food on tour it's pretty much like used up until it's gone you know, like yeah. no matter what it is so if we got hot sauce or something we're just oh cool something new you know put it on everything so yeah i think so nice was it good <laughs> yeah nice i guess i usually remember the bad stuff more than you remember the good shit. <laughs> so yeah yeah so if it was bad i would have been like yeah i definitely remember it being bad but no I, it was good do you have a favorite black metal band yeah uh probably dark funeral uh, dark funeral marduk you know i like some of the older immortal stuff and that was really it you know dark funeral dark funeral was the first black metal band that i heard that was not using like keyboards and stuff because like Cradle of Filth and Dubu Gear, you know, they all had a lot of keyboard players and that stuff sounds cool, but it's not the same as like when Dark Funeral played these like fucking minor chords where they didn't play the bottom string and they'd speed pick and move them all over the place. It, it just had this, like nothing else fucking sounded like that. And I, I thought they might've had a keyboard player because it was just such a, a cool, like, her sound when that hmm. I can't even explain it but it was what uh, it was i don't know there when you first heard this yeah i don't really know it but uh, do you have an album think, to recommend uh, me i got dark funeral tattooed on oh, me wow. when i was okay. like when i was really young uh so you really into it yeah well it was it was like my third tattoo i think yeah yeah you know, i just i just i just wanted it because it had like it just looks like a blob now like mm-hmm. yeah like you can't even I, tell what it says, you know. But Bobiscum Bobiscum Satanas is probably my favorite record because of the song "By Legions Come." But I mean, pretty much Dark Funeral at least has a, a good enough catalog where you can pretty much snap up any record and it sounds like them. They've made they've always done a pretty good job of like they don't really experiment. It just kind of is what it is the whole way through. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with that, but like. You know, there's bands like Cradle of Filth. It, some, it's not like hardcore black metal, but right. I still consider it black metal. But that's like, like the pop you know, version of it, right? Yeah, I mean that's yeah, okay yeah, to it, say. 
if you pick if you pick a record early in the career, I like Cradle of Faith. It's definitely it's definitely different, you know, yeah, depending yeah. on where you pick pick them up. I saw Cradle of Filth with Guar once. Oh no shit! You know That's they cool. did a tour together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah, Viva I La saw band that. Tour. Yes, yes. That's that was it at the old Roseland Ballroom in New York. R.I.P. Yeah, Should I would have liked Guar... to have seen that. Yeah, that was great. Should Guar kill Taylor Swift? That was a rare occasion where Guar was opening. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Much of that until you know until the arenas yes i think war should kill taylor swift what do you think i mean yeah. i think she's pop oh, yeah. she's pop icon enough that it's not going to get old too quickly yeah uh, i think they should yeah how did the eight minute i mean just uncovering it and remixing it right there's not like a secret behind yeah that. yeah so when, i love that i, I the... love that when I had all the tapes, um, you know, like obviously I'm, I'm putting together all the songs and, and then when I think the guys remembered that, that it was cut. So, and none of, and nobody yeah. had ever had a full version of it. Right. Interesting. So when I was able to play it, they go, did you get it all? Let me hear it. Let me hear it. So I, I pull it up and I kind of, cause like I said, it's, it's unmixed. I just have the master tapes. So I, I kind of mm. do like a, a quick mix so we can hear what's going on. Yeah, just like faders everybody, up or whatever. Everybody, yeah, everybody come. It's just like, what the fuck? You know, nobody's heard this shit in fucking 35 so cool. years or whatever. Uh, so was, was there any really other? cool to hear that. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Was there any other, like, cool stuff that was uncovered with that? Like, wasn't there a track where, um, or like the Morality Squad was, was talking about the record or anything or something like that? There was um I don't know what it like a commentary track or something. I, meta I think I titled it. It was called uh Bring Me the Child. Oh, but that was like was a, a skit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. Was that was there. Mm -hmm. They put it on the cassette. Yeah. Sick. Yeah, because it was there was the last reel was it was just written on there, the slave reel. Yeah. And there was one <laughs> There was one section where it was just them banging on shit. And yeah, like that's in there too. Yeah. Oh god, it was terrible to listen to. I it's like, it's, it's a hard listen. listen. It's on Spotify, I believe, and your band and so, the camp too. But but buried. So back then, when you would do a record too, so you only had like sixteen tracks, mm -hmm. and let's just say you used up all the tracks on all the reels. Well, I got to do, I want to record one more thing or one more part. So, okay, well this, so reel number three, which might be these three songs. Well, I'm just making shit up. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. Oh, maggots only has 14 tracks. So we have two more tracks we can use if we mute everything else on maggots. Right. So I'm, I'm listening to one of these songs and like I said, I don't remember which one it was, but I remember it. I was like, well, who the fuck is talking over this one? This one's ruined. And I find there's a track where they had gone back and Dave and Bishop had done this skit together. Mm. And it was just like, <laughs> I mean, you if you can hear it on the tape, it's fucking yeah. hilarious. And I was just like, I just couldn't believe that nobody had heard this. In I think, years. yeah. And it was like, I'm laughing and I'm like, there's um, you know it's one of those things where you i'm by myself in a studio in the middle of the night i'm like nobody else can hear this stuff you know so yeah, i was that must have been really awesome. happy to be able to have that put out and everybody else could hear it too because that was when i almost wish that could have been the record like here sit down with me and discover all this stuff because that's really what i was trying to do with or we were trying to do with the scum dogs record was hear it kind of like how we were hearing it like we're yeah. going through this for the first time and and uncovering all these artifacts that have been buried forever i mean i think bishop was a teenager when they made that like oh yeah yeah they were all that's so crazy young. dude yeah um that's it al did a mix for black and huge somewhere it's somewhere i, I know guess. i know he did horror of yig but i don't yeah. know anything about the other stuff i'd love to hear it
Have you heard Abbott's Motorhead tribute band Bombers? No, I've I've seen pictures of them, but I've never heard them play anything. Do you still consider Guar your was Guar your favorite band? No, I don't, I've never heard you say that. I've never heard you say that. <laughs> they were never my favorite. What's no. your favorite I mean, band? Uh, well, Judas Priest. Okay. Yeah, the Judas Priest always you, been kind of my favorite. Do you know the all female Judas Priest tribute band, Judas Priestess? I do not know. Oh, well, that. you should. My friend, I do some work for them over the years, and my friend Militia is their singer, and she actually just did a duet, a legit duet track with um, Rob Halford. So go check it out. Oh, that's awesome. awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you like Ghost? Guar should kill yeah. Ghost. I mean, I like Ghost, but I think Guar should kill Ghost. I think they should too, just to get a rise out of them. Because yeah, they like, killed Lord. They're never gonna, never gonna take us on tour, so why not? I know. You know what's that? To... Oh yeah, yeah. I don't. You know, I don't think they have anything against us, and no, I, I sure. would only think that. Uh, I don't think they would want to do anything that would encroach on their show. So yeah. I think that they would have, even though we would have a much smaller show because we don't have that kind of money it would i think it would still step on their toes a little bit so they would probably just not have it at this though so nothing there's no bad blood there but i I really like what ghost does uh i haven't seen their show since they started but when i got that first yeah. record the uh opus eponymous or whatever it's called right, right man i listen to that i listen to it every day for like fucking like i, I just had it in my truck in my cd player and you know it would just repeat, and I just let it repeat for like fucking two weeks. It was really cool. Yeah, you know where I saw them at the Williamsburg Music Hall in Brooklyn. Oh, cool! The original Ghost. I, have you ever played there? I know you guys played the Warsaw. Uh I man, I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Um, I I think I pretty much caught up with the comments. So if I missed any pertinent questions. Put it back in. Um, we'll start to land this plane. How about we'll aim for three hours? That's a good three hours. A good, good time, enough. right? Okay, we got ten minutes. You know what? We have an interruption. We need. I need to get this video up. I mean, humongous uh, was trying to find something for us, but what he did find, uh -oh. or what he, yeah, this is this is his contribution. I can't explain it. Hey, uh, just one second there, Kevin. Let me pull up this video. I just got down to Mission denied. What? Mission edit. You didn't say the magic word? Ah, ah, ah. You didn't say the magic word. Are you fucking kidding me? Fucking Zuckerberg, you son of a bitch! Well, evidently that video is not available, so, uh. Oh, a little plumbing advice. How would you rate my backstage fix? I know you're a hell of a plumber. Well, just keep one thing in mind. I may be MacGyver, but that doesn't mean I've always got a roll of duct tape on my ass. <laughs> oh. I don't know if there was a question in there. <laughs> But can you fix Humongous's um, porta potty plumbing? I guess. Yes, but I'll have to charge travel time to get up to fucking Maine. Is he up in Maine? I don't remember where he is. You know, and I just sent him a CD too, because oh, guess what? Humongous fungus of your ungus is on my new album, The Final Boss. Oh, wow. Available now at bonesper.bandcamp.com and on Spotify and YouTube and all the places. Um, his contribution is a bong rip and i told him i want it just like dave's bong rip in nitro burning funny bong and the man oh, delivers yeah awesome yes so that's my little plug thank you everybody uh what's the hardest guar song to play on guitar what's the most fun as well oh, most fun I don't know. It's I think there I think the is. ones He's still that here. you wouldn't know 
the ones that you probably like like billy badass i think was kind of hard to play wait did you guys ever play that no no we never we never played it live but we just had all these like and sometimes things would sound hard and then you like dirks would show me the riff and i go oh that's it that's all you're doing yeah you know like right it sounds so technical you know like uh i don't know i I think some of the um some of the Corey era stuff probably had Mm. more of a difficulty uh, as far as like technical ability here and there like a lot of a lot of fast movements and shit but then again that's just like rhythm you know if you're trying to copy lead guitar it's going to be it's going to be pete era stuff that's going to be the hardest you know so Mm. That really depends. I mean, shit, like just the way he played leads in, um, what is it? If I could be that, not the lead parts, but I know it was hard for me to wrap my head around some of those band and then get right back into those fast scores again. That was my, I, 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 for years I tried to get them to play if I could be that live. And we I was, I was cool. thinking in my head, what song is that? Yeah. I don't know. I it's don't carnival. think they've ever played carnival. that song. Yeah. Oh, I no, because I was like, I want yeah. either that There's one or like... There's some great that record. You're right. I, I, I'm a fan of that record. I'm never going to say I'm not. Sorry. <laughs> one on carnival. that tour, we did, we did If I Could Be That and Interfere. And, I, wow. and Interfere, I think, Dirk's I think I remember that. that. Yeah. But yeah, those were some deep yeah. cuts. I'm glad to... You know what I was... Um, I was really glad you guys did Sonder Commando. We did. Right? Am I thinking of that one? No, it was Issue of Tissue. Wow. Oh. Right? You don't know? You don't know what song you played? <laughs> no, no. Okay. I don't remember that one. Here, let me ask this. What's next for Brent Ferguson? Are we going to get a new U.S. Bastards record? Or are you cooking him something Yeah, else up? so over the summer last year we we did cut a record at my house at my studio here so like i always try to position the camera so it shows all the cool stuff of course but 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 beside me i have a big 32 channel mixing console and all these like i've got drop snakes in every room there i got a vocal room over here uh the room in front of me is a uh got a bunch more guitar cabs and shit like that. We do drums in the furthest room away from here in the basement. So I've taken over my basement and made it a mm-hmm. studio. So we, we did a record here. A lot of fun. I still got to finish a little bit of it. Still got to sing on it. But that should be out soon, as soon as I get off my ass to finish it. And then we'll do a couple tours. Um, I don't really want to tour super long, you know, because some of those Guar tours are kind of exhausting and you know, right. burn me out a little bit. So I'm going to enjoy little bit of a break uh we'll get back on the road again but it's not going to be you know two I'm not weeks at a time on. is good you know something like that two right? three at a time yeah i'm gonna i'm, I'm not i don't want to live on the road but i love yeah. performing and i don't give a shit if it's like if it's 10 or 100 or a thousand people i still have a good time at the show you know playing so to me yes. and i had fun i mean we like we played fucking uh banditos you know burrito lounge in september u.s bastards there was like nobody there and you know i played a couple months before i'm playing Valken. there's fucking 60 40 000 people whatever it is right it's to yeah. me it's like kind of the same feeling it doesn't really i mean it's fucking you get major bragging rights to look out on that crowd and be like yo take a selfie of me with all these motherfuckers out here but to me that's all it is it's just bragging yeah. rights it's like i get yeah. the same rise no matter what the situation is come to new york come play saint vitus i was supposed to go to that rog show but it got canceled because of covid yes yeah we were supposed to do that yeah disappointing we were trying to we were trying so hard to make all that shit happen i remember being on the i don't blame you i don't blame every you. day yeah. yeah well i know i know but just i just i remember like it was yesterday because it was like every day we're like are you sure we okay well what if we do this what if we cancel this what if we i I had my ticket yeah yeah you know what oh i want to bring up this weird because i was at a very unique guar performance and maybe i want to hear your thoughts on it and i think i met you very briefly that day at the brooklyn bazaar 
it was the day before oh Halloween, yeah yeah and you it was just you and blothar and it was like some guitar.com i don't know yeah, yeah that was a weird show i think i i think it was cool but i think we could yeah. have done because it was kind of what we did with the the acoustical album you know right right we didn't have a whole lot of preparation time for that one so it was just kind of like it was really cool but yeah that was it fun it was very to do more stuff like that i mean like th that we did that uh fuck the npr thing oh yeah the tiny desk tiny desk that was so awesome. that was like a sex cow so that fuck was yeah. like a precursor to the, the tiny desk thing yeah which has been gaining a lot of attention i think right people people are into that one I think so. I never, I never watched the show beforehand. Um, oh, I no, I know, but just a lot of, a lot of views on Guar from that, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> He's like. I watch YouTube's about now. fucking. I, I watch YouTube's about Motorhead and repairing martial yeah. ramps and shit. So. <laughs> Humongous needs water for his bong. So. Oh. oh man. I had Casey on here, and I said, "What should I ask?" you and he said something about when are you going to fix his amp so are you fixing Casey's oh, amp? dude i texted him the other day about that actually yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> because yeah because he gave me the number of uh he gave me the number of a guy who's like an ampeg wizard but i don't i work on like tube stuff this one's solid state so it's kind of like it's still a little bit more of a mystery to me than hmm. uh some of the tube shit. but yeah there's yeah, a he, mystery he an inside amp. of Casey's amp. That is. Yeah, he, well, he sent me an amp, and and he was like, "When you turn it on, it makes this horrible noise." So I turned it on, and was like, "Oh goddamn!" Turn it off real <laughs> fast. And then, of course, I got busy with touring and all that shit. But Casey, I love you, buddy. I want to fix your shit. I'm gonna do it for free. I'm gonna nice. get it fixed one day. So one day. I haven't hunt. I haven't been beaten yet. But it did take me fucking. 10 years to fix one amp wow um <laughs> so i kind of want to ask about it but i also kind of don't <laughs> that sounds yeah. like a long story no nah, it's just like you know no. when i started fixing stuff i didn't know is you learn as you go thank you and i don't throw anything away so it's like if i just keep going back to it like every time i learn something new i would go okay well i can try this but right. he, of course, sent me the most complicated amp I've ever had to work on. Thanks, Casey. Thanks, Casey. Yeah. Do you ever get sick of playing yeah, Sick like, of You? Yes. Yeah. Sick we of You is great. sick of call. hearing it, too. <laughs> Just so you know. I know you got to do it for all the casual fans, but... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. We always end up, I always try to end on this question. Not really a question, but can you leave us with a good Dave story or two? Yeah, let's see. <sighs> I got a couple, maybe not all, they're not all family appropriate, but I remember. Well, they're usually, time. they're usually not. Yeah, yeah all yeah. of Zach's involved him being naked. It's, you know. Yeah, so. Breaking shit. <laughs> and, um. So I'll give, uh, I'll give you, I'll give you three. I'll give you okay. three. I'll, I'll take it. I'll start, I'll start hard and I'll, I'll end light. So we were at a, at a gig and this, I know this is not the hardest stage story, but we're at a gig backstage down in the basement and me and, and a guitar tech Gibby are, or not guitar tech, I'm sorry, drum tech Gibby. We're sitting on a couch. Gibby comes in. Dave's sitting across from us. He's got a girl sitting on his lap. And there's another dude who's sitting off to the side, a squirrely guy. He's uh he's staring down Dave and this girl. And I'm watching him. And Dave's oblivious. He doesn't see this guy just mean mugging him. And and I look at Gibby and I go, Something's about to pop. I go, <laughs> and he's like, What's going on? I go, look at dave look at her and then look at him and he he does the triangle and he goes oh so the girl sitting on dave's lap is this guy's wife girlfriend whatever and they're just like i mean all over each other and the fucking dudes i mean like 
I would just get up and pop him in the face if that was my old lady. You know, I wouldn't give a shit if it was my idol or not. But but it took a while for that shit to happen. And then finally it did. And the guy stood up and was like, let's, you know, he was very upset. He was, let's get out of here. That's enough. <laughs> he stood up and dragged his girl by the arm and got her off of Dave. And Dave was just like, what? That's your boyfriend? You know? <laughs> <laughs> And it was just, you know, it's like, it, it might not sound that funny me telling it, but it was funny to watch just because Dave was surprised. The girl was surprised. Me and Gibby were laughing. I know. mean, did did they not know the boyfriend was sitting there or what? No, I don't think Dave had a clue. I think Dave was just bringing girls backstage and hmm. the guy kind of meandered along with her. And I don't think he put two. Because, I wow. mean, she was, she was all over him. They were... I mean, they weren't like fucking or anything, but they were yeah, yeah. touching each other, and she was sitting in his lap in a very provocative way, and yeah. But then, so th- to lighten it up, but Dave still being Dave, uh, we went. So Dave came to my house for Thanksgiving one year, and so he was. We were eating, uh, you know, turkey and all this fucking shit, you know, and Dave were were drinking. And I got two cats. Well, I have at the time I had like five cats, but only two were inside. So the cats were were coming around you. Know, they're circling your feet and kind of like rubbing up against you. And Dave just reaches down and he's like his he's eating with his hands and he goes, "It's just like you got like napkins that walk. <laughs> 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 These napkins just come right up to you." And I was like, "Oh, man, dude, don't rub oh. your fucking greasy turkey fingers in my cat's fur. Come on, man." And uh, so that was fun. He was just drunk as shit. And then, uh, and then my lightest Dave story is, uh, you know, Dave was, uh, there's a lot of parts to him, you know? So we took him when Corey's daughter was born, you know, Corey had already passed away. So very sad situation. So me and my wife, Eve and Dave, uh, Corey's daughter was named Corey. It's funny. My, my first daughter named my Brent named her Brenna. Huh. So, uh, we're, we're naming our daughters after ourselves cause we didn't have boys. And so anyway, baby Corey was born little tiny thing. So we were like, Dave, we gotta go. We gotta go see the baby. Come on. Like, so he gets in the car with us. So it was just very, it was just very, I mean, there's nothing like this really stands out about it other than just him being sweet and him holding a baby. You know, it's like, you could tell he hasn't done it very much because it yeah. was just like, and you know, some people are just fucking weird. Like, ah, but you know, some people are natural. He was a natural holding a baby. So I got a nice picture of him holding Corey's mm-hmm. daughter in his arms when she was just like tiny little thing. And it's just sweet, you know, and even when I'm seeing that, you know, it's just like, I wish, I don't want to publicize stuff like that, but I'm like, man, I wish the fans kind of knew that all this stuff was connected in this way, you know, like that we still try to communicate and keep our, keep everything together. Yeah. So that was, that was cool. That's what, that's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I guess the last thing I'd want to say is, you know, like, Thanks to the fans for being so cool to me the whole time I was in the band. Uh, thanks to all the guys in Guar that st- stuck with me for all the years and gave me a shot. And uh, I will always love them. And I will always hope that they just have the best. You know, I, I told them this while I was there. And I just want them to always remember that I hope that that, that trajectory going upward continues. And that I wish them the best success whether I'm a part of it or not. So, oh yeah. 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 Wait, what's up with this movie? Are you involved in the movie? Is this a teaser? Maybe we shouldn't go there. I just remembered that there's a movie happening. Thank you, Humongous. Hey, I can get Super Chats now. What's that? I said, we've talked about me doing it. So, because it was written with, obviously if a new person steps in, I don't think that they would be excluded. But at the same time, the, there's more there's 11 years of history with pustulus so 
Okay, so it's not written in stone yet or, or anything. I don't know the progress of it. I just know that there's a movie in the works. Yes, thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you. This is, yeah, one of the best, one of the best episodes yet, for sure. I'm going to say that. Awesome. Well, thank uh, you very much for having me. It was a lot of fun. And uh, this is when I would usually promote the next show, but I don't have anything booked right now. So just stay tuned. You know, I'm always got some things cooking. It's going to be, you know, we'll, we'll have some great shows this year. Just stay tuned. Get on the Instagram. Go to what's this Perga Sound? What's Pergasound.com? No, just my website. There's not a lot of stuff on there yet, but I'm trying to grow a YouTube channel and it centers around guitar repair or guitar instrument amplifier repair and shit like that. So nice. if you like to nerd out on gear, that's the place to go. Hell pustulous. Awesome. Oh, thank you. Are you one last question? How does it feel being made into a toy or multiple toys, an action figure coming out? <laughs> I mean, those cool. those things it's look cool. fucking cool. I'm excited. Oh, I don't yeah, know where to put ones. them. That's the my big ones. problem is I don't have space for them. Nah, the newer ones look great. The yeah, I mean, not do. this they one. Do. This one's cool too, but yeah, dude, I'm I'm excited yeah. for that. That is one way to be immortalized into something is to be an action figure, right? Yeah. Hell yeah! All right, all right, guys, that's it. Uh, I don't have anything else for you. Um, Stay tuned for more Guarpod. And um, and I've been working on the Dookie documentary, so stay tuned for news on that, too. And I'll play a little trailer for you. All right, bye. What influence did B-movies have on the band? <laughs> How many tapes do you have? How many loads have you got? It started out as a band that was covering bad songs from bad movies. I mean, it should be looked at as a legacy of Los Angeles. They lived the movie lifestyle. I had seen many of Dookie's movies long before I knew who he was. I first saw Dookie Flyswatter in a Green Jello video. Because as soon as I saw him up on the stage, I go, oh, fuck, that's that guy from Surf Nazis. Roger Ebert said it's the worst movie he's ever seen. They were such a part of our scene. You know, a movie, a cult movie that's got its own fans, we've attracted our own fans and our own family. Within a city of misfits like Hollywood, we were misfits. He's an icon of the underground exploitational genre. Punk rock god of Hollywood. It was neat to see the same faces always orbiting this universe that Dookie Flyswatter seemed to be in the center of. There was celebrities, weird people, cool people, interesting people. Axel and Sass came to see us and I slimed them really good. Paul Stanley and Gene Simmons. Tom Waits was there. I remember Fishbone showing up at a couple of gigs. Kurt D. Lab was afraid of us. When you're sitting between Dookie and Elvira, it doesn't get any cooler than that. Spike Lee wasn't impressed. Just about to go on stage and Lee grabs my shoulder. White Zombie and Haunted Garage and Tool were all on the same bill. I think Soundgarden was opening for you. I would not be surprised. I did a nude painting. Clive Barker owns that painting. Los Angeles seems to be a haven for insularly popular artist situation. You can destroy here. And, uh, and nobody knows where you are anywhere else. It's crazy. We'd like to be an A movie someday. <laughs> a B A movie. An A B movie. Uh, yeah. A B A movie. A B A movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.